The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. Hey, so this play come. Be one of us. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill, episode 128. I like the fact it's really like now like a thing where I have to go, uh, 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 saying the numbers because we're getting up there, Dan. I know, we are powering through them. I'm Dan, you're Gav. You're Gav, I'm Dan. If it's your first time listening, welcome to the clan, the club, the den, the gang, the boys, the crew, the dudes, the... Haunted Hill. Haunted Hill podcast peoples. Welcome. We always had that we always had that fantasy about setting I know some of our listeners and, and followers fantasy? had a fantasy about us uh, setting up an actual like a pub, a haunted hill pub. Oh that'd be nice, wouldn't it? You know, like a castle that's DJ and Yeah. You man, can survey all and then we can just all sit around watching horror films by a big open fire. What do we all do for work? Do we all just sit there like We're all rich. Okay. None of us work. It's gonna be, after a while, I'm going to get a bit like, ah, I'm going to have to rip like, that place down because I won't be able to just stay there every day doing the same thing. You'd, you'd go all um, I'd Jack. Go, I'd go a bit uh, weird. Yeah, you'd I'd, go a bit shining on us. I do go a bit, I, as much as I like my isolation, I do get cabin fever because I'm, uh, and I have to move lots. So, That's yeah. fine. That's all right. It's uh, good to stretch the legs. Listeners, welcome. Um, we're here today with a special episode I realised the other day, like the Patreon episodes. I, I love them because it gives us a new insight into watching, uh, insight into our patrons and their favourite films, and also gives us a chance to review films we might not have even thought of reviewing. And I also thought it's kind of like the patrons' birthday picks, but they get like probably possibly twice a year. Yeah, indeed. Um, this is a patron pick. It's very exciting. Um, every three episodes, for those of you that don't know or can't remember, or this is your first episode, if you're a patron, it means that uh, every three episodes you are up in rotation to tell us which two films you want us to review, um, with a little bit of a blurb from yourself as to why you want us to review them, what they mean to you. And we've had some fun with these in the past. Uh, We've reviewed some wild films that we never thought we would. We've had Donkeys, we've had Dracula. The the patrons never get two in a year. That's not going to happen. I'm just working my math here. That's all right. It's not going to happen. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry, guys. Especially with our, our recent and, delay. <laughs> and, and Dan and I, I only have one birthday a year, so, you know, come on, it's fair for everyone. Yeah, only, only the Queen got two birthdays a year. Rest in peace, Your Majesty. Um, so, yeah, this is a patron episode. Well, let's tell everybody which patron it is. This is Jamie Jenkins, a.k.a. Jamie J. Salmons. She goes by one name on one social media, another name on emails. But I know she's Jamie J. Salmons. Jamie is probably the reason that Gav and I... Well, she is the reason that Gav and I started podcasting. Um, she uh, was podcasting herself. She, her and Gav got chatting. And... Um, Next, our next episode, in fact, will be our Christmas episode, which is also our ninth anniversary of podcasting. So it's thanks to Jamie that um, we kind of just got started on this road of podcasting, really. So it is because um, she was doing the episode. Uh, she did a. She just all of a sudden on Facebook. I was following her f- via musical reasons because I was writing, trying to write music for different things, and um, I thought I could do something she was involved with, and. Um, um, it was a case of all of a sudden not, we were just friends on Facebook and it was when I was very new to podcasting like, like as in like uh, and a listener myself an audience person going oh so this is like radio like really like new to it. oh so this is like radio shows but like and I was so new to it, like she's like oh I'm doing a podcast and I was like oh well, I'll check that out got totally hooked with the Valor podcast love that show yeah um, and it was David from there who was like 
you know, we're going to try and make a little network. And, and that's when me and you got drunk and talked shit. I thought, ah, if, if we like each other, listening, looking, listening to each other talk shit, maybe other people like it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was how it was born. So, yeah, it is kind of Jamie from that. And then that's led on to everything, like like uh, a lot of other people coming on board as podcasters as well. Indeed, it's she's the catalyst. Connection. It's very strange, yeah. But yeah, very so, cool. it... so it's really nice, Jamie. Thank you so kindly for giving us these picks. Yeah, and so she's a very special place in our heart um, and always will have. And she's a brilliant girl. Um, and her husband, Brian, is awesome as well. Um, they, they do their own shows, like we said. But, but we're to, here to talk about her and her um, picks. So this episode, she is sending us down the rabbit hole of high exploitation, the subgenre of high exploitation, also known I, as... I knew nothing of it. Also known as Psycho Biddy Horror. Psycho Biddy! Psycho oh, Biddy, baby. shit, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, <sighs> and I that... thought hags, I thought it was like witches. I suppose you could class a witch as a hag. So I looked up the Wikipedia term for hag, and it was an, a woman of uh, possibly age, or possibly an uh, uh, ugly woman, which, you know, that's what it said in the description, and um, d- different things, and, and appearance of possibly like a witch as well was a little bit in there, of hag. Yeah. So we'll look at what they, what that, you know, we'll look so at what that... you can't call someone a hag in the street. It's quite offensive. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. No, no. But so yes. we'll, we'll look at what, what, what that subgenre means and we'll pick a few for you guys who want to look at them. You probably have seen some. I mean, just for example, you may not realise, but Misery is a high exploitation film. Nice. Falls under that category. We've covered that many, many years ago. And I guess we're looking at... Um, sorry to cut you off there. I guess it, we're looking at sort of... Uh, uh, female leading roles who are the female who are slightly crazy slightly older yeah yeah hmm. um okay i don't want to say one. i don't want to say ugly women because that's like uh, no it's not that. but it is it's older women like women that are middle-aged and older usually and, and like hereditary is another example she's not tony collette isn't particularly old but that is another high exploitation style movie uh, um, this is like some new subgenre of horror I yeah it's know. cool man it's cool so the two picks that we've got are Straight Jacket. So for anyone that hasn't seen Straight Jacket, uh, and then we've got both both of Joan Crawford these two movies. Both are. for Joan Crawford and the so other Joan one. Joan Crawford double build to be honest with you. It is, but the other one also stars Betty Davis. The classic Betty Davis, who who's just scared me ever since I watched that Disney movie where she, in the woods. Watcher in the yes, Woods. Watcher, Watcher in, in the, the woods. woods. Watched that as a kid and just went, nah, I have it on DVD. Maybe we should one day cover it. I've not seen we it could since. Do. We could Got do. it on DVD and haven't watched it. Um, it's probably not scary in the slightest now. Well, that movie is Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, which you, I'm sure Sorry, you would yes. have heard of. It's very got a very famous title, as have a lot of a lot of high exploitation movies. Have got very funny long names, which I really like. I was looking at all these movies around this time, and I love all like the white covers that with like a drawings of the uh, main cast on it it's screaming it's they all look the same the same sort of font type and stuff yeah hmm. um, so yeah. we'll get into that we'll get into high exploitation but first this is our intro let's catch up let's talk what's been going on let's say what have we been watching um gav what have you been watching i've been doing murder mystery f- uh, october november sorry november um oh, this year's just flown by um I've been. I was on a steady diet. I have. I'm still on a steady diet of Columbo. I've gone. Off, I've gone off Tom Selleck and his moustache and his hairy chest. I've gone on to cigar chomping, slightly uh, uh, wonky eyed, raincoat wearing Columbo. Looks like he smells a bit. It. He, he probably smells of cheese. Cheese and cigars. Yeah. Um, and I've been loving it. I picked up at a car boot sale, uh, season one. I was like, I don't really know Columbo. Like, the second episode is directed by Spielberg, you know. That, but each episode is like an hour and a half, isn't it? It is. And you get, like, the last one I watched yesterday with Nemo, um, Leonard Nimoy was the yeah. killer. And I love the format of them where you see the killer at the beginning. Yep. So instead of like murder she wrote or whatever so you're there with the um so you're like now going right i'm going to sit back now knowing who the killer is and who done it and how they did it but i'm going to watch columbo how he figures it out it's such an ingenious way of doing it the way i what i love about columbo and he is my favorite tv detective oh cool yeah what i love about it is it flips everything on its head so rather than um 
the the good guy being stressed for the entire and you know the entire episode or the entire film the baddie is the one that's stressing because and we know that he's stressing for the whole 90 minutes and we know at some point Columbo is going to figure this out yeah. and it's just when it's going to happen when's the penny going to drop but you watch this for example Leonard Nimoy or whoever you watch them sweating for 90 minutes because they're like because we know we've seen them kill in the first 10 minutes of the episode so we know they've done it you know that's usually how the format works yeah, and then totally. Columbo's just there piecing it together slowly but like I say an hour and a half as well like there's an episode with John Cassavetes as a a, um, a comp- a poser and uh, no he's an orchestra- orchestration you know he's a thing with Jiggy and uh, he he's a killer in it and then he got another episode with uh, Leslie Nielsen's in it but he wasn't the killer surprisingly which I was straight away I was like he's going to be the killer but really enjoyed watching him to the point in the daytime because I got through season one and I was like oh on Freev IMDB's free TV channel you've got seven seasons so like, fuck yes yeah so um, in the daytime I've got to go to work and I'm like oh, but I just want to like cancel work there's been times where I've been almost like I, I might cancel work so I could just sit here and watch Columbo it's <laughs> raining outside I just watch Columbo so I was doing Columbo then in the evening I was going to sleep I was watching a Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes because I've got the box set of that as well nice because he's my favourite Sherlock Holmes and it's fucking brilliant but I love the fact Watson in it is this bumbling idiot if you know the though that series um he's such a bumbling idiot the uh the uh watson in it with the massage <laughs> he was only 50 he's only five years older than me in it and i'm like whoa and, it, and, then he, and he died at 58 from like a heart attack i was like wow it's a different time you know anyway oh. um that's been my diet of murder mysteries and i've been bloody loving it cool about, man yeah how about you uh, yeah, I've been doing some murder mystery. I finally caught up and finished season three of True Detective. Um, oh, okay. I I, uh, I know nothing really of it. Any good? Really good. It was better than season two, although I really like season two. Um, but it's, it, it's still not as good as season one. But it's very good. Um, it's a little bit more in the same vein as season one with like really horrible murders and things being investigated and children and all that kind of stuff uh the main star in it was Mahashala Ali who is going to be Blade in the new Marvel movie when it eventually comes out uh but he was really good in it uh and yeah it was just very very good and you know although each episode is just over an hour around about an hour long they do fly by because you know you know it's just so well put together and you're just like really into all this it's just really it makes you feel like you need a shower after each episode. So yeah, <laughs> I did that. Um, that's what I've been watching. And there was another TV show I watched actually, which is very old now. Uh, well, not that old, but I've been wanting to watch it for a long, long, long time. And I treated myself, uh, and I bought it digitally on Amazon. And that is a show called Fear Itself, mm. uh, which is a Mick Garris creation. Uh, I've not seen it. No. Yeah. It's, um. I think eight episodes it was. Some of them didn't get aired originally. They only aired about half the series on TV, and then it got cancelled. But all eight episodes, I think it's eight, are available on um, on Prime if you do want to either rent them or, or it's cheaper to buy the whole lot. It's like £10. Uh, and it stars, you know, Elizabeth Moss, Eric Roberts, Brandon Routh. Each episode has someone in it, Anna Kendrick. There's people you notice. You're like, oh. Oh, them, oh, them, oh, them. Um, and it's obviously famous horror directors as well. Uh, it kind of follows on from, um, what was the other show? Um, Masters of Horror. It's almost like a bit of a continuation of that in some ways, mm. but but with more sort of next generation of horror directors. But yeah, I've really had a good time with that. Um, so that's two TV shows. And then before I let you talk, I'm going to keep talking for one more second because it is relevant. I also finally, talking of TV shows, I also started watching uh, Giammaro del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. Yeah, I've seen a couple of those. I, I saw the, I, I've seen the first three. Um, I, I never made the 31 and 31, um, but I did, uh, which is in, incredible that I didn't make it. It was such a shame. Anyway, but I did do a couple of those and added those, even though they weren't like feature one hour and a half. But I was like, no, they're still cool. It's a horror story. So... Where did you like them? Yeah, I did. I've um, never seen the, fir- them. the first one was lot lot three six, which was okay. I, 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 um, kind of, I kind of enjoyed that. I really liked the rat one though. That really yeah, that's cool. Was quite disturbing at times actually. Uh, the effects are incredible. But the one that I, the last one I watched, which has blown me away, with F. Murray Abraham, is called the autopsy. I've not seen it. My God, that was. I think that was episode three, and it is just. I mean, the effects 
anyway, but it's got a bit of a um, autopsy of Jane Doe vibe about it. Um, you know, it's just one guy, but he's got about 15 bodies. He's got to do an autopsy on because there was a big industrial accident. Accident. I won't say any more. I definitely, obviously, you're probably going to get around to watching them all at some point anyway, but it's definitely my favourite one so far. But I hear they're all brilliant, and I'm looking forward to getting through them all. Um, Ooh, so, yeah, that, that was me. Sorry, I'll wrap it on there. Right, um, you. I do need to apologise uh, to the listeners and you. Oh. Um, uh, last episode, um, I was just finishing the bounce down of the, well, finishing the edit before I went to bounce it down. And uh, the kids came home, and I think all the kids came round, and it becomes very hectic when my kids walk in the door and the dog bark, and they will just stomp in and start talking to me at once. And I was just finishing the editing of the last show, and the outro music got uh, stuck a little bit in the uh, episode somewhere. I think I kind of grabbed it by accident and just threw it into the mix somewhere. So I do apologise for no outro last time and been a bit weird. And the other apologies to you, where I completely ignored you last time which yeah. is something i tend to do at times but i think because the last time i was think i was reading imdb as you're talking and then you you went and said something and i went well that's not very interesting and then went and said the thing and the connection you said well that's what i was saying do you remember oh yes you i remember me yeah. and i felt really bad and this is i don't no, no, mean no, to I, do it i can't i didn't it. Me- i didn't message you to make you feel bad i just no, said it, it's just but I, just I have a problem with my attention span it's like, <laughs> it is literally a medical it's what well, i imagine it is it's a mental thing that's what i was about to say rather than a medical thing and i just struggle very hard i have to concentrate on one thing as soon as i do that i go oh god dan was still talking i don't know what dan said but so, it is hard yeah. because um a little bit behind the scenes we don't do you you don't do a lot of editing we we just waffle on and we take breaks um and occasionally there'll be a mistake that's made or something but it um, happens it yeah happens. so but that only means ladies and gentlemen if you in your life make an accident or do something wrong it's fine because we're all human and we're not robots and that is probably good that we do make accidents once in a while speak it's not, for it yourself. people are speak you a robot yourself. i'm a sex robot a sex robot from the future it's like uh, that uh, Simpsons episode Halloween one, and uh, they're like, "Where's sex toy? Um, where's sex toy?" And he comes in, and he goes, "Where have you been?" He goes, ah, "Where haven't I been?" Oh. Anyway, should we get on to this episode? Too. We should. Um, a couple of other very quick things. Uh, I went to watch Wakanda Forever, the new Marvel movie. Uh, it was brilliant. Um, for anyone worried, how they dealt with the passing of Chadwick Boseman. Um, oh, here's the lead dude, the last one, right? I'm not seen. I'm not seen. So, so I know. Oh, right, so they had to. Uh, 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 his character's not in it then, obviously. Yeah, basically, but the whole thing is like a, a tribute to Chadwick Boseman, but also to the Black Panther, but also it's really a really interesting way of looking at grief as well. So it's great. I enjoyed that, and I need to mention uh, we don't we do sometimes mention celebrities that have passed away, and this might seem odd, but Jason David Frank, who played the Green Ranger and the White Ranger from um, the Power Rangers movie, uh, the Power Rangers show in the '90s and some of the movies, uh, he passed away. Uh, actually, took his own life sadly through poor mental health. Um, this is a guy that's a black belt in about five different martial arts. He's got cool tattoos all over him he was a hero to so many people now i was a bit older in the 90s but i did still watch the power rangers with my little brother and i really followed this guy's life uh he had a youtube channel and he jumped out of airplanes and did all this cool stuff and he went to all the conventions um and out of the blue that was announced that he passed away i think he's 49 so he's only a few years older than us um really handsome cool uh talented physical guy uh, you know and it just goes to show you and we've talked about this now again and the reason i'm bringing it up is guys especially guys but everybody talk about how you're feeling because no one saw this come in he broke up with his wife or had a, a, a something with his wife early this year and unfortunately took his own life and it's so incredibly sad he was a hero to a lot of people perhaps a bit younger than us but i still really looked up to this guy so Go, go, Power Rangers to that guy. And, um, yeah, that was a bit, a bit of a sad one. But, yeah, talk about how you're feeling, if you feel like you can. Please do, because we want you here. I heard a great phrase the other day, which is, no matter how you feel or how you think people feel about you, we want you here. Mm, it's very we true. do. It's very true. Um, yeah. 
Uh, absolutely, if you do need to talk. It's very hard to talk sometimes. If it you're, is. In a, I know if you're that. in a certain state of mind. No, I'm not, sort of, I'm not counteracting what you're saying in any way. If you're in a certain state, I'm saying this from my own, own, own side, from my own feedings when I've had it before. When you're in that sort of state of mind, it's real gnarly. Uh, sometimes I've been like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to get under the blanket, and that's it. And uh, that's what happened to me a little bit. Um, I found it quite hard to talk, but I actually at times I would like message sometimes you and I'd WhatsApp you, but I wouldn't talk. But I would actually find it easier to kind of message people than just get a thing back because then I could read it over and over and over and over, and it kind of do you know what I mean? Almost yeah, like a man uh, mantra or something. And the same thing the other way around. There's been a couple of points in my life where you've known that I've not been I've been going on off the radar, mm. and you've been messaging me and ringing me. Mm. And I just don't want to speak to you, not even you or anybody. No, no, no don't take offence uh, by it, but yeah. yeah. But, but we, we've all got a wingman or we've all got someone, guys, you know, so do try and reach and out, if find you strength. you haven't got a wingman, me and Dan have your wingmen. How's that? Yeah, we've done it in so, the past. Yeah, we've said it in the past. We, we've, you know, we've, we've talked to people before, so we can talk to you too. Anyway. I know, I just wanted to say that. That's all. Um... Now, for some reason, Jamie, I don't know if this was something to do with you, but Gav has found a harmonica. Jesus Christ. Oh, baby, I like it raw. So he is apparently going to be pop popping up occasionally, deliverance I, style I here and there. Possibly. I don't think I, uh, <laughs> it's going to get to the point when sometimes, like the Halloween episode, Sarah said to me, were you eating? I was like, oh, I did eat a little bit of food when I was recording. She's like, don't eat when you record, okay? But she told me off a bit. Um, so I don't know how she's going to react to... Oh, so Help me, listeners. Jamie, so, someone, uh, send help. I think, really, we needed deliverance to be covering that. We've done it before. We've done deliverance. I don't so want to do deliverance do again. <laughs> let's, go, <laughs> let's go up that river again. Oh, up Chick Creek without lube. Without um, lube, yep. Paddles, cu no, loop. Uh, cu couple of bits of episode. horror news, and then we'll get into the episode, because I'm moving away from loop, oh, and I want to get into news. No, I need to make a coffee before we get into it, so my brain works. Go for it. Uh, Escape from New York. There is a re remake slash reboot happening, but the news is very confusing about it. Some people are saying Kurt Russell is in it. Some people are saying that his son is in it. Some people that are saying it's good. a remake. Some people are saying it's a reboot. It Escape from England. I don't know what it is, but it's happening. It's something's happening. I needed to mention that. Also, <laughs> I hope James, something's happening. James Wan and um, Bloom, Jason Bloomhouse are merging their companies. <sighs> what does this mean, that, Gav? That, that means that they're just going to get to the point where there's this <laughs> mediocre jump scare loud volume. We've made loads of money because we got you in the cinema. I knew that your answer would be something along those lines which is why I pretty much why I asked that to you then it, uh, at the same time I'm not dissing those guys at all because I, I love the fact that they've uh, uh, brought out some pretty cool fucking movies they're behind some pretty good movies it's just like the Jason Bloom like the whole like it's almost like a Roger Corman type thing. So it's just like uh, okay we could make four good movies this year or 500 and and it's it's that which kind of bugs me. It's like, please, can we stop wasting these resources and just really I, make some fucking top top class films? I actually don't mind some of the Bloomhouse movies. No, and because you've got such a variety, I'm going. You know, I'm contradicting myself. Because you've got such a variety, you can pick and choose, like yeah, Paranormal, paranormal Activity movies and stuff. I, I, love I those films, you know. And I know that Jamie, talking of our patron for this episode, I know that she's a big fan of James Wan as well uh, and all the Conjuring stuff. Oh no, one of us. Yeah, she loves that goddamn one of us. She coined that phrase. No, um, so, but yeah, I just thought it was funny that they're merging their companies together. They're going to be like the the Disney Plus of horror films or something. I don't know. What it's going to be the Wanger verse. The Wanger, Wanger verse. <laughs> Welcome to the Wanger verse. Welcome to Wanger verse. <laughs> Um, right, well, I think we should have a little break, come back, talk about Psycho Biddies, and then get into our first film. And I, also, by the way, Jamie's email. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And by the way, Jamie, I can't fucking wait to talk about these films. Uh, um, hadn't seen Straight Jacket, had seen the other. 
um, Vice versa for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I fucking love it. I love the fact, the fact that Straight Jacket is just shot like shot by William Castle, for, for fuck's sake. And it was uh, pretty much a film noir. And it is brutal. I, I, and we'll get into it, but what, one thing really I will quickly film. say is really I don't good. know how either of these were released in the cinema in the early 60s without people protesting and going crazy with some of the scenes, but we'll get into that. Cause... We'll get into it because William Castle was a similarity to Haunted House on Haunted Hill and the way the shadows are used and things like that. So we, we will get into this, my friend. Okay, well, we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll take a we'll, break. We'll take a break, have a Kit Kat, and then we'll get into some psycho biddies. Psycho Ooh. biddies. And as Agent Cooper said, treat yourself. So ladies and gentlemen, treat yourself with a day. So I'm going to make me a pot of coffee for my little treat. Oh, I wish I had some apple pie to go with that. Um, what's that movie? American Pie. Anyway, let's get out of here. <laughs> uh, just the two fingers going together. Shh, up in the air. No, I didn't. All right, see you later, guys. We, uh, bye. That's the episode. <laughs> have a break. Oh, we'll have a break. We're back in a minute. This will keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, You can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. Hey, welcome back. So, uh, high exploitation. What is it? Well, let's start off with Jamie's letter, our patron of, you know, she's leading us this episode. So, she says, hello, fellas. I'm so honoured and excited. Hello. 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 I'm Michael Kane. (laughs) Hi. I'm not going to go through all our repertoire. That's not too Two impressions that we've got. Uh, She says, I'm so honoured and excited to get to programme this episode. So maybe we are robots, Gav. She's programming us. Maybe. Uh, I'm sure you were expecting a couple of lichen-centric films coming from me, so my apologies if you're looking forward to that. Now, we did have a secret bet on, didn't we? Because Jamie and Brian do a show show called uh, Liking It, uh, all about werewolves, and we appeared on it. Uh, for an episode, so we 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 well, said so we peed on it for a minute. Like, it. like werewolves may pee on things to mark territory. We were here. Yeah. We went. We appeared on a show and we peed on it. <laughs> um, sorry, Jamie, it's already fallen apart. Um, yes, we had a secret bet on that. It would probably be werewolf movies, and you came at us with Psycho Biddies. Wow. Uh, she said, "So apologies if you're looking forward to that, lol." But. I'm hoping these choices will be just as fun and exciting. I've always been drawn to high exploitation, also known as psycho biddy movies, and these are two of my favourites. I think it partially comes from growing up with my grandparents. We used to watch a lot of the old movies, and I also loved horror from the moment I was born, so these were a natural fit. The, they were also horror movies that I could watch with my grandmother, and that is rare. I can't. I personally Gab, cannot think of a horror film I would watch with my one of my grandparents. Uh, I used to watch with my grandma all the time. My, Jesus. my whole family, I don't know why, my uncle must have got it from my gran, like his mum, but my gran would have loads of videotapes of movies and things. She's always constantly taping. Every time I go around and look there, she's writing on the writing on the spine of a videotape. She's always recording stuff. So I sat with her, the, the, the rug I've got in my bathroom, which I kept. Um, I laid on that and watched A Company of Wolves with my gran. Brilliant. When I was super young, she'd let me just watch anything. It was brilliant. And then my uncle was into, uh, into loads of movies. I watched things from him. Centrillion Girls and Doctor Who movies and stuff like that. 
And probably he things massive, like he, um, movie collection. he still has a really big movie collection. I was there not long ago. Movies, I don't even know what they are. So what is this? I don't, like real like noirish sort of stuff, like the things like, like I don't know what this is like super rare shit. It's like, I have no idea what this film is. <laughs> you know, he's got a collection of them. I've never Amazing. heard of them. Never heard <clears throat> of them. Weird. Anyway, well, I'm, sorry. I'm not, yes. I'm not going to read um, the next couple of bits of her email. I'm going to read them in chunks as we come to each film because they're kind of like an intro to those films. Mm. So I'll just skip to the end, as they say in, in Spaced. Uh, she says, so there you go, mates. Now, she's used a very good British term there. So Cheers, lots- geezer. All right, mate. Um, she says, so there you go, mates. I can't wait to hear your thoughts. I hope you love them as I do. Much love always, Jamie, with a heart emoji. And oh. a big heart emoji kiss back to you, Jamie, too. Thank you ever so much. We yes. love you lots. Thanks. Now, what the fuck is high exploitation? Let's get into it, Gav. So you'd never really come across this before? I don't this even term. know if I, I've uh, come across the term whatsoever. Great. So it is essentially, let me give you a little brief synopsis. Uh, it is some, it's psychobilly high exploitation. features a mixture of horror, thriller, and women's film elements, usually involving aging women who have grown mentally unbalanced and violent. Mm. So you, can't, you almost summed it up in your unique way earlier in this episode when you said, uh, you know, they're a bit crazy they're a bit violent they are and that's what this is um there was a good period of this really happening throughout the 60s and 70s but you still get the odd film turn up now and again it's like in, in the movie we're going to talk about uh, it's in it my 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 notes as i go basically betty davis is the wild card and to be honest i'd rather hang out of the wild card we'll get into that Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, now, the titles for these psychobilly movies are kind of, for me, they remind me a bit of um, Jallo, because Jallo movies have always got crazy long names, like the cat with nine tails that looked through the budgie's eyes on, de- <laughs> on death's door. You know, and the, the, the crystal... tarantula's legs went up the elephant's nostril. Yeah, they're always called things like that. Trunk. And some some of these movies have got names. Some of the time, quite a lot of the time, they're a question as well. So let, let's run through some of these. We've got 1969. Whatever happened to Auntie Alice? Yeah. Okay. We've got we've got what's the matter with Helen from 1971? What is the matter with Helen? What's the matter with her? What is the matter? <laughs> who who slew Auntie Rue? 1972. I've, uh, I've read that title. Sweet Charlotte. Hush, hush, sweet Charlotte. Gav, 2015, Shyamalan did his own with The Visit. That is a Psycho Biddy movie. Oh. Cool. Um, you watched one, I believe you watched this one for one of your 31, Burnt Offerings, another Psycho Biddy movie with Karen Black. Yes. Yeah, great movie. We should cover that at some point. Yeah, we should do. Um, I don't know what I was going to say. Carry on. The Beast in the Cellar. Uh, which I've seen a couple of old ladies keeping something or someone in their cellar. Would, would, would the rabbit wall. grannies be one? I'm not sure about that. But the Watcher in the Woods is one, and you did mention that. Oh, there we go. It's Betty Davis again, though, isn't it? It is Betty Davis. Also, uh, a um, Hammer horror, so I watched this for my Hall- Halloweens. Die, Die, My Darling. Brilliant. That's a sort, sort of Dane title we'd come up with. Uh, also, another uh, Hammer one, and that is The Nanny with Betty Davis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these, I'm giving you guys some um, some be- some of the better offerings. There's a, you know, there's probably 30 or 40 official high exploitation movies. Whatever happened to Baby Jade, obviously, in Straight Jacket, we're going to be covering. Um, I Saw What You Did, Berserk with Joan Crawford, Two on a Guillotine, uh, Lady in a Cage, which we covered, Gav. Oh, that's really good. That was uh, uh, Fingy Jiggy's first movie. Uh, James Caan. James Caan. Yeah, uh, Misery, which I touched on. So you know, there's a very. They're, they're, you go into these. They're they're more thriller than they are horror, but there's usually something, something nasty happening in them. Something to watch out for. Um, that's just a taste. But let's get to the meat of the matter, which is the two movies that we're going to be covering. So we're going to start you in order. You love getting to the meat, don't you? I do love getting to the meat. I was talking to you earlier about swallowing, wasn't I? <laughs> Just so you all understand, um, I've got a little bit of a cold at the moment, so I took some soluble tablets. But 
the first time I took them yesterday, I didn't realise they were soluble. I just thought, how the hell am I supposed to swallow a tablet this size? So I did <coughs> swallow it, uh, and then realised this morning I should have let them dissolve in water. Anyway, Sweet. just goes to show that I have no gag reflex. Well, right. Like I said, if you'd have plugged it, that would have been fucking brilliant. That one at the bum, though, I'm done. Mm-hmm. So we are going to start off with 1962's Whatever Happened to Baby Jean. Let's have a trailer. And then we'll get into why Jamie's chosen this and then the synopsis and all that good stuff. I'm going to be right back. Sister, sister, oh so fair. Why is there blood all over your hair? Whatever happened to baby Jane? To seek the answer to that question, we will follow a man plotting a murder. Highly specialized work. But Robert Aldridge has considerable experience in such matters. He has a dozen successful pictures to his credit. His stars are Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. The scene, an Italianate villa in a once fashionable section of Los Angeles. Its halls, once crowded with the bright, the beautiful, and the celebrated, now echo only to hectic whispers, the insistent call of a buzzer better left unanswered. A telephone that has become an object of fear. A supper tray that will not be touched. A window barred against the world. A hammer. A mute scrawl crying for help. From these elements, director Aldrich has fashioned a motion picture with a curious title. Whatever happened to baby Jane? (laughs) Betty Davis is Jane Hudson. Crawford is Blanche Hudson, but we must warn you, if you're long-standing fans of Miss Davis and Miss Crawford, this motion picture is quite unlike anything they have ever done. It is a bold essay in the art of the macabre, a venture to the ultimate reaches of terror. A motion picture definitely not for the squeamish. And we beg you, as the tension builds to the screaming point, A shock after shock assaults your senses. Try to remember that this is only a motion picture. Try and remember. No, we uh, we can't show you anymore. Only when you see whatever happened to Baby Jane will you know, and the answer is total suspense. So that was the trailer for Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. So before we look at the synopsis and get into the the chat about the film, the review, um, Jamie, back to you. She says, she talks about her grandmother, and she says, my grandmother introduced me to Baby Jane when I was six. Six years old, Gavin. (laughs) Bloody hell. She says, I distinctly remember coming home from the supermarket one Saturday and planning to watch television. I was standing at the TV, turning the dial... Uh, to flip through channels when I landed on Star Trek I was about to sit down to watch Star Trek when my grandmother said oh go back sadly that meant I had to go all the way around the dial again remember oh those days? amazing <laughs> remember those days of going around the old dial <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think um, well I don't think I actually had it as a dial um, for us it was, it was probably like button oh, it would be a we had a control. dial on our first TV at home it must have been I think you're right like real it was early a, yeah it was a wood panel TV around um, the same time as Atari yeah like, yeah because you, know, you had to flick game. it to like channel 5 to play Atari didn't you yeah and my grandparents my nan definitely would have had like an older TV so yeah yeah. Of course, we're talking about our knobs. Um, you know, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, I'd go around my nans and twist my knob. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. So anyway, Jamie says, her grandmother said, oh, go back. That meant going all the way around back the dial again. But she had spotted that baby Jane was on and wanted to show it to me. She told me all about the bad blood between Jane Crawford and Betty Davis, and I was fascinated. So the synopsis, thank you for that, Jamie. The synopsis is a former child star torments her paraplegic sister in their decaying Hollywood mansion. 1962, uh, directed by Robert Aldrich. Uh, Robert Aldrich directed The Dirty Dozen, Gav. Yeah, he did. He did. He did a few cowboy movies, uh, a few movies around this sort of genre. He almost uh, said that in like a filthy, sexy way. What? 
The dirty dozen. Yeah, when you said it, don't need to do it again. You did it. Carry I'm going to... Uh, if I make things sound sexy, that's just the way I talk, okay? Yeah. I can't help it. So, yeah, directed by Robert Aldrich, um, and starring, as we've said, starring Joan Crawford and Betty Davis. So... The Feud. Uh, I'd kind of forgotten about this, and I wish I'd researched it. I do apologise. And I do know that they may have made possibly a TV show uh, 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 on this. Um, it might be even... Uh, British produced anyway um, back in the day then obviously you know it had been whatever the newspapers told you you are reading and that's the feud that you know so so and so doesn't like so and so because of whatever reason mm. you didn't have the internet to check it out so you have to we have to think like these ways so like for Jamie been like wow the fascination and it whatever was wanted to be mm, slightly twisted to sell the newspapers you know yeah. It's an interesting time. They were two very high profile actresses. This is the early sixties and they were they'd already had good careers. Their careers were not coming to an end, but there were parts of their careers that were not great, as in they were both getting into alcohol and possibly pills and stuff as well. Um and you can tell by Betty Davis' face a little bit that she's definitely... And she plays drunk so well in this film. So, so well. Um, yeah. Um, and in some ways, I... Not only is it a feud, but also it was it was kind of like... The the, the, 80, the, the 80s young man in me is, is putting this into another... Flipping this on its head and saying, this was kind of like... If Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger made a film in the 80s, because you got these two on screen, it was like getting De Niro and Pacino together finally in Heat. And although they only had one scene, it was like, wow, we've got these two in a film together, you know? And they hate each other. That was the extra thing. They hate each other as well. Wow. Yeah. You know? uh, what was the uh, hate? What was the uh, main cause of argument? I think they just both saw each other as I'm better than you, no, I'm better than you. Well, I'm a better actress, so, no, I'm more of an artist than you. So do we know if they were in this feud when they made this film and did that elevate their characters' performances? So there is a piece of trivia uh, on IMDb that does say that they were very respectful of each other. Um, and all when they in would, production. Yeah, and all they would really say is, you know, Joan would say, like, Betty's very, very good at her job, she's always on time, yeah. and... Betty would say, like, Joan does this, you know, but they weren't really sort of hanging out together and, you know what I mean? It's so, mm. so I think, yeah, I think that's what added to some of the, a lot of the tension as well. But this shit's happened, uh, um, this shit happened then. They had, like, the Tower Inferno, like, Steve McQueen and, uh, I can't remember who else it was, both arguing that their name should be at the top of the uh, poster. So one of them... The one on the right was slightly higher, so the one on the left slightly lower. This yeah. is like, what? Well, you know, but I guess it's going to happen. And for a lot of, like, especially in the Hollywood times of this time here, this is when, like, it was, like, a massive, massive thing. Like, Hollywood was huge, you know. Yeah, this is, like, the golden era of yeah. cinema. Um, yeah having like the groups of the British just having their games of tennis every Sunday and like that's a little British group in Hollywood and there's all that sort of stuff it was a crazy crazy time it's funny to have these arguments things but a lot of time though you'd find with like you do nowadays though these sort of people who have these lives which are completely different from our lives and most majority of everyday people's lives it's a crazy like you only know those people you're all friends probably with each other I know it might be different nowadays you can, that's not completely real but then do you know what I mean you were an elite group almost so it must have been quite easy to have these feuds and arguments especially if you're like oh I'm the leading lady oh no I am so really interesting that this is the catalyst of this story yeah yeah and and, and here they're playing sisters you know it's crazy. fascinating really so that gives it if you look at that and if we had had this conversation then i was like now let's go watch this now and take my notes i'd probably look at it slightly even differently now but that has opened up my eyes now for us going forwards with us talking about this film it'd be imagine if it was like james carnan and kathy bates used to be married got divorced and then made misery that would be the sort Absolutely. of tension you'd get like Coming that. Coming back you know? together. You do have that at times. You do have actors that do come back together who have been relationships. 
I think Brad and Angeline Jolie or something, I think they might have done, or some couple like that, you know. Um, yeah, interesting. That would have been an interesting dynamic. But this is really interesting to know that, and that's, I think, going to help this conversation. It's a long movie. Indeed. Now, I, yeah, it is a long movie for, for its time. It's just it's two hours and 15 minutes, which is very strange for an early 60s movie. And I'd never seen it before. In my head, I thought I'd seen it, uh, and I hadn't. So this was the first time watching for me, Jamie. So thank you ever so much. Gav, you had seen this before. I picked um, it up from a charity shop uh, only like two years ago. I found a Blu-ray copy. And um, yeah, maybe two years ago. And I watched it. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. And it was certainly on my list of things I wanted to see. It was on my want to watch list. I, so I just bumped, bumped it up for this episode. I enjoyed it more this time. It always happens that every once in a while when we have to review a film and I sit and have to sit and really sort of watch the film, um, I always like get more a lot more out of it. And it's really nice to be able to do that. So this, this time around, it's like, oh, this is a really good film. You know, it's a really weird story. Who came up with this story? It's good, you know what I mean? It's a really bizarre story. They have like this midway point where, uh, just before the midway point, a, a side story comes in. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? Like, okay. What, what formula are we on here? What is going on? It's you're, talking about, you're talking about the, the pianist. Penis. Penis. He is a penis. Yes. Um, and one other thing I'll say before we get into t chatting about the film is. Stephen King clearly must have been slightly influenced when he wrote Misery. Um, there's some, you know, there's some vibes, wheelchairs. It's like it. He might have been in the yeah. cinema watching it, but then it's like got the idea, you know, yeah, absolutely. Doing cocaine, have some popcorn. Because that's what Stephen King did. Um, great, well, let's get started. So we start 1917. off in... 1917. Fucking hell, couldn't fucking take this song. Jesus Christ, this little girl, it's baby Jane. Oh, uh, yeah. Is that is this the woman she's like, uh, daddy writing a letter to daddy? Oh, yeah, daddy's dead, but fucking hell, child, stop saying I hope, I hope daddy can get my letter in heaven. Oh, fuck, oh my God. Fucking hell. But, but also, just, it, you know. It's also a bit, it is, if she wasn't uh, so screechy, it's quite a sad. Oh, yeah. I understand that, but but, but, then, but I was I'm 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 completely bowled over by that fucking voice. I was like, ah, oh, fucking musicals, fucking. But then, I know it's not a musical. But later on, it makes it even more terrifying when she's singing it again, but trying to dress like she did when she was eight years old. But she's now fifty-eight yeah, I, years old. It's just like ah. I think it's brilliant. Um, I like lo I, I love it. It's really good. But as we get into this, I think it's be a really good conversation. So, we are introduced to Baby Jane Hudson. I'm completely in the wrong, though, you know, because sold-out performances for this girl. She is uh, like a child singing. star. She's the Justin Bieber of 1917. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody around America wants to come and see Baby Jane Hudson. She is singing, tap dancing. She does it all. She even tells jokes. They like her so much, Gav, they've made full-size dolls of her that you can buy for $3.50. Um, they're about the same size as her. I don't know what you're going to do with a full-size doll, but... Weird. It is weird. It's now, weird she has a sister. Shit. She has a sister called Blanche, played when she's older by Joan Crawford. Now, Poor old Blanche is just off the side watching her sister soak up all the limelight, isn't she? Uh-huh. She's the ugly duckling. They say, don't worry, one day I'm sure people will love you as much as they love your sister, Blanche. Don't worry about it. Poor old Blanche. Yeah, I, I'm an only child, but I do have three kids, and my middle child, Daisy, she knows she is middle child. We've even chat. I sometimes say to her, all right, middle child, she'll say stuff to me. It's just like fucking. Uh, all right, you do get the same amount of attention, you know. Um, I can understand uh, from seeing that dynamic how these things work. You were, you have siblings of both sides, you know, male and female sibling. How was that? Did you have any? I'm the oldest, so I'm the of, boss. Uh, oh, okay. So you, so you never had any sense of. I just beat everyone up. They just did what I said. That's it. That's the way to do, it, I suppose. Yeah, I didn't beat um, them up so badly. Like I, I did push them around, but. I was only 18 months older than my sister, and I was eight years older than my brother, so if I'd have tried to beat up my brother, I would have probably killed him. So. Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, totally. And, you know, I've got even my twins who are the same age, they argue over 
and they want to fuss and fight over the same thing and they both want the limelight the attention so definitely going to be something that happens so, um, but, so Blanche doesn't like it does she <laughs> but they do they are a bit mean to her because they say things like oh look at the way everyone loves her Blanche everyone loves baby Jane don't they look oh they are a bit mean to her but and I do refer to her in my notes as BJ because baby <laughs> Jane is too hard to write down every time. Um, so BJ does show her true colours immediately when the show's over, doesn't she, Gal? Because she... I wish I hadn't called her BJ. OK, well, Baby Jane steps out the back yeah. of the, uh, the, you know, the stage, the theatre, and in front of all of the fans and all the press, she starts, I want an ice cream. Well, and her dad's like, well, look, you don't need an ice cream. I want an ice cream. I'm the one that makes all the money in the family, so I get an ice cream. And she's really, she knows that she is. She's like Michael Jackson was when he was 10. He was the one that made the money in the Jackson family. Screaming and about she's... wanting ice creams. I want ice cream. Is that how Michael Jackson would sing it? Oh, it sounded like James Brown. I can't do it. James Brown? Every time, Ow! I can't do it. James, James, would you like some ice cream? Ow! <laughs> That's quite a good impression. I like that. Very good. Well done. Um, yes, so true colours are shown. And she kicks off in public. And this is kind of the start of the downfall, really. So she goes through what the Corys have gone through and a lot of child actors. You know, where, everyone loves you when you're a kid. But when you reach adulthood, like Macaulay Culkin or somebody like that, you just no one wants to know you because you're not a cute little kitty anymore, are you? No, and and I was going to bring this up, so I'm glad you did. Like the whole phrasing, whatever happened to that is something yeah. which has always been something we say and we say now and we go, oh, now we just pull out our pockets, uh, our phones. We've gone IMDb and we go, oh, okay, oh, they're not, ret- oh, they they they're a parent nowadays. Oh, that oh fuck, they're dead. You know, yeah. We say these things and it's it's. Yeah, and it's one of those things. If you're popular, famous, and then all of a sudden that goes, where we're going to see in this film and this storyline how that could affect someone. And some people just get along with it fine. Um, uh, I know people who have been uh, fairly big at things and then are now normal people, and they can adjust. But some people can't. I imagine it must be quite hard when you've had that ego trip boosted so high. Somebody like Macaulay Culkin does seem to deal with it quite well, though. He kind of is, embraces the fact that he was a cute kid who isn't anymore, but I think he he's still... I think he lives in France. Likes <laughs> drinking French yeah, wine and he, eating French bread. yourself, you know. Yeah. Fair enough. Enjoy yourself, my yeah, friend. Baguettes. Just don't, you know, leave, get left home alone. Otherwise... Um, but, so yeah, that's an interesting point, actually, Gav. We do say that a lot. And in fact, a lot of news articles will come up on your Facebook feed or whatever, you know. Whatever happened to these 10 movie stars for, who were kids, where are they now? And we're what fascinated do they look like? by this sort of thing. We always have been. You won't believe what so-and-so looks like now. You yeah, know? absolutely. Like, so, so, yeah, well, of course they look like that. They're 40 years older than they were in the, when they were in the never-ending story. And, of course and, they don't look like yeah, they do. And I'd rather they look like that rather than fucking blown up lips with... It'd be a bit weird if the girl from the Never Ending Story still looked a bit like the girl from the Never Ending Story. I'd be like, well, yeah. well she's clearly had a bit of work done then, hasn't she? Um, now we jump ahead. What Did, it, did, did they it. stay a year on the screen? 1935. I missed that, but I assume they did. And we're That's sitting like... in a private screening uh, of some... Uh, it looks like a, producer, a couple of producers uh, or director. I think both producers. I think they're both they producers. <clears throat> yes. And they're watching... A showreel of Blan of um, uh, Betty Davies, aren't they? Baby Jane. Jane, yes. But it, uh, it's her when she's older. She's older, and she's awful. I, to, to be fair, I I am a massive. That's why I really enjoyed these. So thanks again, Jamie. I am a massive fan of black and white films. I watch black and white films a lot. I like absolutely adore them. Um, and I've seen all sorts, and I've seen some badly acted ones as well. And it wasn't that bad, like, of course. You know. But, but for the... their, for their, for this and that, they are putting it across as it's a bad acting. And obviously, this is symbolising Jane's now baby Jane. It's not baby Jane. She's a grown up Jane, and yeah. she just hasn't got what she had. And they're stuck in a contract, aren't they? Because they've got both the sisters. Yeah. So they need to break the contract. Yeah, because Blanche, so just to fill you guys in, Blanche, Joan Crawford, 
it's flipped. She's become incredibly successful. She's won loads of awards and Oscars and yeah. everything else. She's a much loved actress, and actually. Jane is now in her sister's shadow, so it's completely re- reversed, just as it predicted by their mum. Don't worry, Joan, when you're older, and um, Blanche, when you're older, and it's happened. And baby Jane is just, she's getting all these, you know, auditions just because of who she used to be and because her sister is in a contract where, you know, if you sign me, then my sister needs to get a job somewhere in this studio as well. But the, the producers don't want her. They think she's terrible. Um, you know, she's not cute anymore. They, she can't they act. They, they sell these things. Don't even finish the story because the other guy's no. like, uh, maybe we get to the end, it might be all right. It's like, no, 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 shit, turn it off. No. She says, they also say things like, well, don't, let's not forget, you know, she drinks a lot um, and she's a bit violent towards people on the set in between, you know, sh- shots. Unfortunately, some of that, I believe, I don't know about the violence, but I know that Betty Davies did have a bit of a booze problem. So there is a bit of a foreshadowing it's, of what would happen. It's a shame that it was uh, then would have been such a very fucking black and white, and that's not anything to do with colour of skin, just generally black and white, like down the line with like, what happened and what didn't, and it was all very formulaic, and it all went that paperwork of like the filmmakers when they were assigning which director to which project and stuff, you know. Yeah. But it'd be a shame that they weren't a bit more loose cannons and they're like, right, well, this is how, like, th- I'm just saying how you could get around this problem. This is what this person's like. Let's find something or write something for what would work with the way she is. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. how you could get around it. So you could work around it, but they're just, obviously, that's going to, that takes up time. And this guy's, this this is, guy's obviously yeah. like a sort of person who's like, I don't give a fuck. Let's get onto something which is going to make me money. But exactly. This is, this yeah. is 1935. It's so there, are, yeah. there aren't many scripts floating around Hollywood, really. You know? Presumably so, yeah, true. And this is a great little bit of exposition so we finally we end this scene with basically now knowing that blanche is the one that's really popular and famous biggest thing in movies right now jane is the one that no one really can be bothered to hire Fuck her. she's she's got problems with booze and violence and but they're contractually obliged to get her a job occasionally because of blanche yeah we then cut to a terrible car accident Straight away, though, my Colum- cause I've been watching Columbo so much. And, and, oh, and, God, he's worked and, out. And, yeah, straight away, I was just like, oh, oh. If you were a detective, your thing, like, so Columbo's got his cigar, Tom Selleck's got his hair, or his hairy chest and his hair and his Ferrari. What, what would I have, then? You'd have your mouth organ. I probably would. I'd walk up to a thing, I'd walk in and say, Hello, boys. I don't know why I'm saying I've got somebody who's all weird Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> Hello, boys. <laughs> What's going on? Okay. <laughs> Tell me more while I play. You would, cause, Maybe cause, not my uh, thinking music. Poirot had his moustache. I've got a harmonica. Head. Yep. Brilliant. There we go. I'll be called That's Harry. It. Harry Harmonica. Harry Whore. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Harmonica. No, Harmonica Harry would have to be. Yeah, or oh, Harmonica Whore. Why? Yeah. Well... Terrible car accident, but it's purposely not shown. Um, but what, what happens. happens though? Well, spoiler. So if you haven't seen this film, we are going to spoil it. But in the in this scene, it looks like no, no, that's not spoiler. We did the twist uh, at the end as well. Okay. But we, what 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 has basically happened? Well, it looks like Baby Someone. Jane. Yeah, yeah, someone's getting out of a car to open a gate, and the person left in the car puts their foot down and. Drives um, in, drives straight into them, and we now see Joan Crawford in a wheelchair. So we assume, yeah, no, knowing what, knowing what actually is the ending, and if I was to watch that bit again now, I'd be like, how? What? I, I we we'll get to it, but I am a bit like, well, how, how the fuck did that happen? But we we we'll, mm. we'll get to it. And we go to the title and the credits now. Credits. Great score. Um, we get the smashed um, Baby Jane doll. That that zoom in on that. So this Baby Jane doll will come up a lot, uh, and it's quite a spooky looking doll, really, as as these kind of old dolls are. And we show the neighbours basically, don't we? Yeah, they're called and the Bates. It's um, just a, a lady sitting on a sofa, a younger lady, and she's watching a movie, and it 
we find out that the, the actress on the movie that they're watching, which is back in the day on TV, so when it's on, it's on, there's no VHS player to record it. It literally, when it's on, it's on, or if you missed it, fuck it, you missed it. That's, that's your tough luck, you know. So they're catching a film in the afternoon or whatever, and it's one of the ladies who lives next door. Yes. How that, cool is of, that? One of the Hudson sisters. But it's says. not that cool because they've never seen them. This bit reminded me of Jamie's email, actually, you know, flicking through the channels and coming across one of these films, you know? I don't know. It's kind of... I'm, I'm wondering if that's one of the reasons that she loved this film as well, just because you've got that kind of aspect as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, and it's a, a young lady, and she's sitting with her mother watching it. So, yeah, it's you know, very and meta again, there. A bit more exposition here as well. They, she says, you know, um, the Hudson sisters next door, one of them is a cripple. Uh, so they use that word. I don't think it's very PC to say that these days, but one of them is disabled in a wheelchair, etc. Handicapped, et yeah. Handicapped, yeah, I don't know what, what we say. Um, and some people say the other one may have done it, she says to her daughter. Um, and, yeah, they're, they're watching Blanche on the TV saying what a great actress she was. And we do cut, indeed, to Blanche, to Joan Crawford, in she... a wheelchair. Yeah, we do. Uh, this is Blanche. Um uh, I was confused. It doesn't take much. I was confused at first. So for the first couple of my notes, I had them round the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, and then I was like, oh no, what am I doing? So I had to go back and sort of rethink. I was like, for God's sake. But that's just because it's me. Um, Blanche, uh, yeah, Blanche in the wheelchair and Baby Jane is is drinking. She is drinking. She's fucking having it. She's smashing bottles. It's she's fucking it hammer away, time. If MC Hammer's there, he'd be just dancing around her in his shiny pants. <laughs> she's hammering those drinks. And she walks in to Blanche's room. Calls her an idiot. Calls her an idiot. Turns off the TV. It's like, basically, fuck you. <laughs> because Blanche, Blanche is sort of looking at the TV, like, all starry-eyed, like, oh, those were the days when I could walk. But also when I was a famous <sighs> movie star and... Yeah. And I had such a because she's got all this romantic memories from making all these films during Hollywood's big you know times, and Betty Davis is just like yeah you're an idiot turns it off and keeps drinking vodka or whatever it's gin booze she, goes, she puts an order in later doesn't she Jesus it's Christ. gotta be hard though when you've got to look after someone twenty four seven pretty much make all their meals like. I can see how Betty Davis, who already is slightly unhinged, could uh, uh, lose it, old Jane. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can see that. It, it's, it's only a matter of time, really. I do a true crime type podcast, a high strangeness podcast, plug, plug. Um, but, like, you know, you see this sort of thing, and it's only a matter of time. It really is. And, this, and that's what we see. And I'm, um, you know, that um, Alfred Hitchcock was considered to direct this. Which is interesting because I feel like he would have done a good job, and also the neighbours are called the Bates as well. So, um, yeah, but he that's, was busy. busy that's man. really interesting. Um, yeah. So, what, Mrs. Bates. I wonder what choices he would have made. But yeah, go on. Mrs. Bates knocks on the door and says, "Look, I'd like to give some flowers to your sister. We've just seen her on the television. Me and my daughter thought, you know, she's brilliant." And which is BJ. A very no nice thing to do, isn't it? It is, but BJ is very, very rude to her. She snatches them off of her. Yeah, 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 whatever. I'll tell her what you said. And she she sort of takes them off her. And she, you don't know if she's actually going to take them up to her. Now, this is where we find out that Blanche is very annoyingly has got a buzzer in her room. Well, before... before, before don't give me... Oh, you wait. Before we get to that rant <laughs> that I'm going to have... Um, uh, there's there's a bit where she Blanche goes over because she's she has a a bird in a cage we see it's oh, yes, her pet right. bird budgie budgie in a cage and I know a budgie is kind of like a, a cage type animal but come on though it's a bird birds are great like a bird bird can hop along you know or it can go I'm going to go for the day to France then I'm coming back then I'm going to shit on someone's head. And just, hop, and just hop around. It's fucking amazing. Not being fucking in the cage. Hell. Flying. They can fly. Not sitting in the cage, they can't. Get a cat. Get a cat. How perfect's that? You've got a lap there because you're in a wheelchair. That cat is happy. Absolutely happy. I don't like the fact she's got this bird. And I feel like it's almost a bit of a metaphor, though, for her position. Caged. Indeed. She's kind of stuck, stranded with the outside My... being her sister looking after her. My mum, God rest her soul, had budgies 
all like since I was about five years old, mm. she had always had three or four budgies, and she'd let them out to fly around the living room. But I just always used to say to her, "Why the hell have you got pet budgies, Mum? Get a cat." Get a cat. <laughs> Why, mum? And she'd be like, no, they're great. And they'd like land on her and she'd be like the bird lady. And I'd be like, yeah, okay, cool. I get that. But get a cat or a dog or a puma or something. A puma. Brilliant. A puma. Um, yes. So she takes her bird cage off to clean it, doesn't she? Well, that will come back in a minute. Absolutely. She's already told a neighbour that she's too unfit to go out. You won't see my sister. She's not coming out when she's handed those flowers. So it's that kind of misery almost. It is a bit. It's already putting up this wall already. And it's like, this is, we're looking at, you know, we're dropping into their everyday life and it's always been fairly normal. Um, Every day a bit of a hate that person who wants to go to bed, wake up, carry on anyway. But now we're at the beginning of the story where this is where things start going wrong. So she's putting up this wall saying, the neighbours, oh, she doesn't come out. She's almost like, it's almost like a methodological, uh, methodological killer where they're starting to go, okay, I need to think very far ahead and start doing little things and building up. Mm-hmm. So it puts me out of the picture as a main suspect, you know. It's almost like that the way she's doing it. Right. So I'm you're ready. not going to see her. You know, it's almost built out of probably like pl- slowly playing this in my head. You're not going to see her. You're not going to see her until the point where, you know, if I kill her, it's not a problem because you haven't seen her for so long. Do you know what I mean? Indeed. Now I'm ready for your rant. So Blanche oh has Oh my a... God, this uh, hang on, buzzer. Wait, wait. Let, me, let me set this up. So Blanche has a buzzer to <sighs> buzz her sister, which... If my sister was Joan Crawford, alcoholic, violent, very unhinged, I'd probably buzz once. She is and alcoholic it, and slightly unhinged and buzz because, it a couple more times. because of the fucking buzzer. But yeah, exactly. She's just keeping her finger on it over and over again. It's and then when every time she gets up to her, she's like, "What? Who was on the telephone?" But it's not yeah. that important. I just wondered who was at the back door. It's not that important Fucking for you to shut do that. Up, Joan. This, so this is the point I was like, I want to hang out with Wildcard. Okay, I get you. I get where you're coming from now. I'd still want to be hanging out with Joan and her budgie. The fuck Joan and her budgie? <laughs> fuck Joan and her budgie. I have no sympathy. I'm sorry that the accident happened and you're stuck in here. I don't like your budgie. But Wild Card is doing some crazy shit. She's having a party, though. I'm fucking hanging. Oh, I actually could say to her, let's have a party. Let's go round up some people. Yeah, she knows people as well back back in the day. She's old old Imagine school Hollywood. Imagine partying with Betty Davis. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah you, you're doing you're doing coke off each other's bums. I'm sure. For, oh my god, wow. I I don't know. The podcast on the Haunted Hill does not know if <laughs> Betty Davis do cocaine off people's bottoms or not. Okay. Well, BJ takes up her food. They discuss their careers. Um, they discuss, you know, how my career ended when I was younger and I'm trying my best, but I'm not nowhere as good as you. Everyone loves you, Joan. And Joan's just kind of like, oh, but, you know, she's all very romantic. And, and we are really led to love Blanche. I know she's got the buzzer, but we do love her because she, she is a victim, it seems. She's in a wheelchair. She's trapped. I, I, I'm with wild card, so I, di- I disagree with you. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, the budgie's taken off to be cleaned, and we meet one of my favourite characters. The budgie's budget. not being cleaned. <laughs> I'm going to clean your budgie. <laughs> um, oh, excuse me. We meet one of my favourite characters, uh, which is Elvira, the cleaner, or the whatever she is. She's a bit of everything. Like a clean, cleaner, clean, clean my clean. budgie. Oh, God. So Elvira turns out, great name, by the way, Elvira, and she's the cleaner. And she, Blanche, we find out, Blanche is confiding in her um she knows you know she talks to her a lot well yeah and she she doesn't even need to you can see it's from the outside perspective because she even says look what i found in the trash your fucking letters uh, uh, addressed to you which have already been opened and it's fan mail yeah. pretty much and by the way when i put the rubbish out every day there's always about 12 empty bottles of wine and rum and whiskey and you don't drink, Joan, do you? So I think it's Betty Davies that's putting all this booze away. Because it ain't me. I'm not smashed. I'm not drunk doing all the cleaning. Who is it then? Imagine that, though, if you had a cleaner and they came around and just got fucking hammered. 
Well, people pay for naked cleaners, so I suppose yeah, you could pay I, for a drunk cleaner. Me and Sarah watched a little doc, mini documentary, and it's basically an advert for the fucking company, because at the end it was their website. I was like, it's just an advert they've made themselves. And it was like topless cleaners. It's really weird. weird. Well, whatever floats your boat. Yeah, but it's um, obviously, you're obviously doing it just to look at some tits. Obviously. You're not doing it, to, otherwise you just get a normal cleaner. It's going to cost you more money. You're doing it yeah. to look at boobs. If you could sit there, so why are you sitting there watching a the cleaner? Most people, when they get a cleaner in, don't watch the cleaner. No. no. The whole and point if they is, do, I have got time, so I'm out of the house. Yeah. Well, anyway, enough about topless cleaners. So, yes, um, Blanche confides about her sister's boozing, and as you said, Elvira says, well, look, here's all your fan mail. Um, Elvira has her top on as well. She's got a top on for this whole movie. She says to Elvira, well, look, I've got to try and break the news to baby Jane that I'm selling the house, that we've run out of money. And this house is being sold in the next six weeks. How the hell do I tell her? And Elvira's like, I think you're just going to have to sort of just rip it off like a plaster and just tell her. But this is a woman who is on the verge of exploding. She's so drunk. Um, and she bursts in the room and says, your bird flew away. Good, good. Oh. I, I said good in my notes. Eventually I'd get to the point where I'm like, oh, that's a shame. I thought the bird had flown to France. They they agree that Jane needs help from a doctor. Um, and we one thing we didn't mention was that Jane can do a perfect impression of her sister. Because when she went up to talk to her earlier, she said, uh, the neighbours were saying that your films were good. And she said, oh, really? What did they say about me? She went, oh, really? What did they say about me? So she does this like spot-on impression. But actually... It was Joan Crawford, um, dubbed over. I was going to say, that, that's probably something done in post, yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah, it looks good. Uh, and this comes into play now because uh, Jane phones up the liquor store and puts in a probably $100 worth of booze order. It's declined. Yeah. We've been told not to deliver any more to you. All oh, right, I'll go and get my sister then. And she does this whole brilliant act. Oh, come here. Who is it? It's... The liquor store. Oh, okay, I'll speak to them. She does the two voices. She comes on the phone. She pretends to be Joan Crawford and says, "Okay, I'd like to order uh, some whiskey, some vodka." Da, da, da. She orders it all, and then she gives the phone. I say, gives the phone back using air quotations, and then it finishes with Betty Davis going, "See, I told you that my sister was uh, blah blah." And then she orders all the booze and make sure it arrives as soon as possible. And, and like you were saying earlier, <laughs> she's quite scary with that fucking the, the Goldilocks, the haircut still, like the child child look. It kind of reminds me of Mother Firefly from House of Thousand Corpses. Yeah, because she does this look, especially later on when she's performing to the pianist, and she just sort of does this look where she sort of goes all starry-eyed and looks away like she is literally ten years old again. I'm thinking Very of, good. I'm thinking of Shay Moon Zombie in House of Thousand Corpses, Baby uh, Firefly, where she does that performance on stage. Oh, yeah. But yeah. she's pretending to be like a little girl, Yeah. It's quite really unhinged, creepy. really, isn't it? Yeah, and the booze, the booze, the the not really seeing anybody. There's not having any friends. It's it's the whole dynamic of what's going on in there. It's just fucking. She's just going into that pit of hell. She knows what she's doing because she leaves the phone off the hook as well, so, so she, Blanche she, can. I think that she's probably kind of bored and amusing herself with this stuff. That's oh, where yeah. it starts going, like, oh, I'm just going to do this for a laugh. And then she starts doing these tricks, and it's like, yeah, but the consequence... And she doesn't realise the consequence, like, later on, when on, on the beach, right at the end of it. Like she still oh, doesn't, that's amazing. She still doesn't realise the consequences of what she's doing. She just doesn't get it. Yeah. Oh, I'll go it's get amazing. her ice cream. What? I've got to say, you know, they're both great performances, but Betty Davis' performance is absolutely incredible in this film. Um, she just goes to a place that... It must have been out. super hard to come out of the character when you finish shooting. Yeah, because, I mean, the next scene we're about to discuss is where she she's she's really drunk and she sings to her doll, the doll of her, when she was eight or nine. So, again, you've got that reminder of what you were, you know, that, that physical reminder, a doll. And she sings to it. And then the scene ends with her just screaming into the mirror just screaming at herself in the mirror and it's just she goes to this place i've never it's just it's terrifying it really is uh the buzzer goes 
Oh, fucking hell. The buzzer goes. BJ goes nuts. The, the buzzer, buzzer goes. goes it just keeps going. <clears throat> well, she's picked the wrong time to tell her sister that they're selling the house, but she does tell her now anyway. She says, money's not great. It's running out, and we're going to sell the house. And she says, well, hang on a minute. I paid for this house as a kid. I'm baby Jane Hudson. I'm the one that brought the money in. I paid for this house. You can't sell this house. And they argue. Um, and this is where baby Jane rips the phone out and takes it out of her room. It takes the, uh, the buzzer, isn't it? Takes the buzzer. And then she leaves her. <coughs> I don't with blame her. her. She leaves her with a plate with a little lid over it. And uh, baby Jane thinks, um, Blanche thinks, oh, well, at least I'll eat my sandwich. What's in here? What is in there, Gav? Um, oh, that's the that's her lost bird that flew budge, away. It's a budgie sandwich. It's a budgie widge. A budge widge. Sand budgie. Um, it, what, what, I think it was the phone line, actually, at first. I think it's the buzzer next. Uh, yeah, she takes the phone out. It's the phone it? It, And it's like being shut off. And I had this that time when I paralysed myself and I was stuck in a room for a few weeks and it's before mobile phones and well, before the phones of we have nowadays. And I couldn't get to the phone. And it was well, it wasn't very nice. Like literally cut off from the world. It wasn't very good. That was a good weekend that, wasn't it? Do you remember that? Fucking hell. That was a few weeks. Jesus. Um crazy. So uh Baby Jane goes out leaving Blanche trapped in the house. The phone is uh, the phone is working now, but how does she tackle the stairs? So this is this reminds me this bit now of Lady in a Cage because she's got to figure out how to get down the stairs. Oh, very 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 true. Yeah. yeah and also misery because you know he's in a wheelchair and that and he's trying to get around the house. Incredibly tense scene in that film. Um so yeah, you, you know, there's influences and that's that's what films are. Um but yeah, how to tackle the stairs. Anyway, Blanche tries to call the neighbours in the garden. She said, hello, hello, Mrs. Bates, hello. But they've got their music playing really loud. She fucking doesn't put much of an effort in to shout, though. Hello, help me. So that's to put a bit more effort in. Well, what does she do, Gav? She types out a letter. And makes a little paper ball. <laughs> Pulls herself up to the window and throws out. Right, what you should have done is made a fucking paper aeroplane. Paper aeroplane would have been better. Now, we've got a drunk driving Betty Davies driving all around Amer America. Driving all around America. Wild card. Just driving all around the Hollywood. And she gets back. This is horrible, this bit now. She gets back. Joan's thrown that ball of paper and it's bounced and it's not gone where she wanted it to go. And sadly, it's landed on the path. And sadly, Baby Jane has seen that ball of paper. And just picks up as it thinks it's litter, but she does read it. Before, very, 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 very quickly, just to sneak back in there, just a bit of a quick rewind. Um, while Betty was out, old Baby Jane, she actually took out an ad because she wants to get the old band back together. That's right, she did. Now, I didn't know what she was doing initially. I uh, didn't. Until I the didn't. scene later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, she basically wants to rejuvenate her career, so she puts an ad in a newspaper for a pianist, not a penis. And that's a different type of ad. That's a different type of ad in a different type of newspaper. When you're back. talking about six inches of column space, that is something completely different. Um... <laughs> you're like our wild card, aren't you? <laughs> um, sorry, that was an awful, terrible pervert laugh then. Wild cod. Ooh. So, yeah, uh, that's what she's been doing. She gets back. She picks up the ball of paper. Um, and it's it's not good. She, 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 she reads it. Now, this is what you should have done. Made the paper airplane. But in the paper airplane, you just go, it just is in there. Look up here. Then when they look up, you go, hey, wait a minute. And then you do it again. And they get, you know, the actual message. That way you're not incriminating yourself. When crazy sister, baby, wild card... Jane picks it up and reads it. And she reads the letter. Later, she brings <laughs> she brings dinner to Blanche. And she sort of says, you're not going to sell this house. I read the letter. You know, I'll make sure you don't sell this house. And that's kind of the end of that scene. Now we move on to a uh, new plot. She um, <laughs> did bring up some more food, though. She brought uh, up another that... tray. Oh, no, that, that's in a little bit. Oh, is it? Okay. It. Yeah, we, we suddenly go to this random side plot now where we get this really tall guy like Lenny from Most Men, really big, tall man. 
Uh, it's got a very strange British accent. You are wrong. That... She did bring in the meal just before we have that side plot come in. She brought another tray up of food and put it next to the other one, which was already there. All oh, right. I've um, got it in a different area then. I think I am going to start having my meals like that. I'm going to have at least three to five courses on a tray. A big everything Silver. will be stainless steel, stainless steel, and I'm going to have a big lid. Yeah, and you I never think, know what you're going to get under there. Uh, it makes it really exciting every Sco time. Scooby-Doo and Shaggy always had food like that. They did, and it always be a bit like a big chicken, I guess. And, like, they take the lid off, and there would Steam. be... Steam. It'd be higher than the lid. It would be impossible, and the sandwich would be, like, three times the height of the lid. Like and Doctor Who's TARDIS. Exactly, and then Scooby would be like, ooh, and he'd, like, squish ooh. it down and eat the whole thing in one. And Shaggy would be annoyed he didn't get any. But that's yeah. what I'm going to do, I think. I'm going to pick that shit up, and I'm going to do that every meal time. I think that's fucking elaborate, and I love it. Well, let's get on to Edwin, the pianist. Uh, and his and his mother. Right. What's going on here? Why is he still with his mum? Oh yeah, because he's be because he's a bit of a fucking dick, really. He is a dick. He's like, don't worry, mum. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna basically suck all your money from you. I'm just gonna uh, live here, and I, I am getting on a bit, but I'm still living here. And it, I, it comes across straight away. He is actually a pianist, and he's, he's, so he can do this. But it comes across straight away as they're both con artists. Yeah, but also his mum is, she does smother him a bit, because when they find the advert from Baby Jane for a musician, his mum's like, I'll ring them for you. And he's like, oh, okay, so she telephones them but on his behalf. I looked at, no, <coughs> I looked at that because they're both con eyes. And she's pretending to be it's a, a looks. It makes it look more elaborate. Okay, okay. So she says, um, okay, 4pm tomorrow, he'll be there for his... Appointment. I, I love it though because they're thinking, "Oh, what can we get out of this?" Somehow, it, it's um, it's a bit like Parasite almost. You seen that film? Yes, I have. Yeah, it's a really, bit like that really, kind really of really thing. Good. And um, they don't know what they're getting involved with. You're getting involved with Baby Jane. You literally don't know what you're getting involved with. No, it's not good. I, I, it's a weird it's thing cool, to though. drop in it, but I like it because it does open this whole thing. I don't like him straight away. I just don't like those. So I'm like straight away thinking he's going to get fucking knifed up. I'm thinking because this movie makes me jump to thinking of Psycho. And it's I'm, cool though, yeah, because it's got that side plot of a con artist and you're thinking they're going to get killed. A situation. These people come into it like oh, he's definitely going to get killed. That does. I, I always like it when the baddies in a film get meet people that are worse than them. Yeah. You know, it's always cool yeah, when that and happens. And then all of a sudden, up. you're like, oh, I'm on the side of the first baddie because I've kind of got to know him because I don't like this person that's come into it. Yeah. And it's a really weird thing to have that. Like, oh, I'm on the side of the bad one. Then all of a sudden, that other one's put out of it. Then you're back to going, oh, okay, now you're the bad person. Interesting. Well, going back to the Hudson sisters then, um, Blanche has stopped eating much now since the budgie incident, and she accuses <laughs> yeah. Jane yeah. of poisoning her food. Yeah. Um, and then... Elvira is given the day off. She says, look, take the day off. Take the week off, in fact, Elvira. This is Jane saying this to her. We don't need you, all right? Um, just go away. And she says to her, see you next Tuesday. Now, I don't know if that was intentional. Oh, yeah. As we all know, C-U-N-T, see you next Tuesday is a bit of a, a phrase. I would she, say that probably is. That's a bit rude if she did. I would say that is, and well spotted. Um, and and also, Blanche is kind of uh, realizing that her predicament a bit more. Yeah, because when once her she's realizing gone... that she's she yeah she, she and also she's realizing she hasn't eaten she and she's kind of a bit stuck to eat she can't eat or drink. Well, this is where Jane says to her, "Well, it's up to you, but just to let you know, there are rats in the basement." And she walks out of the room, and of course, she takes the lid off. And there is a rat on the plate this time. On a plate, and, and it's, it's not good. Pretty bad. The cleaners got a little bit suspicious as well at this point. Having well, a day off. Just to say as well, just to show where these two women are at emotionally. When she sees the rat, Baby Jane laughs like the Joker, maniacally crazy laughing, and Blanche just screams. So one of them has been pushed to the edge of. You know, they're, they're terrified. And the other one is just a, a maniac now. And that is where we're at with these two right now. Absolutely. So the pianist shows up. The pianist shows up the next day. <laughs> yes, he does. 
Is it, this is know. a weird one. He must be like thinking, what am I getting involved with here? But he doesn't care. It's just money, isn't it? Yeah, it is weird. He gets to this house, uh, you know, and she's like, don't you know who I am? But he, but being a con man, and it's, it's kind of like that, how you make friends and influence people. He you go up along yeah. with what they're saying and egg them on and be like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, yes, yes, I do remember you, yes, yes. Yeah, and he says things like, wow, your voice is still, wow, you still got it, you're still wonderful. Boosting the ego, because it's, it's telling the person what they want to hear and just to go, oh, yeah, that, 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 and they're like, oh, great, 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 and then they, you know, you they kind of trust in you. So she says her plan, which is, I'm baby Jane Hudson, and I'm going to revive my act, uh, I'm going to hit the road. <laughs> hey, where are they going to go? Imagine that, know. imagine the fight to see this game. What the hell is going on? You've just got um, Edwin, the pianist, and Baby Jane Hudson, who's actually an old lady Hudson. Does he really want to go on stage with her? Is it worth that much money? Well, $100 he plays a week. And uh, this is where Baby Jane finally loses it with a buzzer. And she that, gives rip, her sister. Rip that buzzer out. Oh, I don't she slaps her. her. Slaps her across the face. It, it's, it's fucking buzzer time. Goes back downstairs, and this is where she sings. Off the back of that, off, off the back of slapping her paraplegic sister, she goes downstairs and sings, I'm sending a letter to Daddy. Oh, my God. Um, and the pianist, Edwin, just plays along. Blanche is just slightly surprised and a, little bit, a bit confused. Like, who's downstairs? Because she said, my friend's down there. No, you can't come down there. Well, she slaps her. But because he kisses um, Baby Jane's ass so much, she's like, look, you're hired. You are hired. They, You've got the job. They compare daddies. Yep. Weird. Weird. And he just says to her, when can I be paid? And then we, the real con man comes out then. When can I be paid? She says, oh. Um, well, he, well mo he moans about his mother a bit as well. And it's like, oh, my God. Don't live with her then. Eventually, she says, look, I can probably give you some money next Wednesday. He's like, mm, all right, I suppose that'll have to do. Yeah, and she's super excited and says, let's go out for dinner, a meal to celebrate. It's a bit weird, isn't it? It is. Is, is it going to turn into some gilf sort of situation going on? Mm. Well, while they're out... Hag gilf. Blanche rummages around upstairs and she finds some candy bars. Hilf. Hilf. What's that one? Hag, Hag I'd, I'd like to... Oh. Oh, I don't know. Dear me, Gavin. Yep. <laughs> Maybe, maybe cough then. Um, Blanche yeah. finds some candy. She eats that. So she's finally eating something. Oh, she finds a receipt, so all the wine has been bought. Oh, she does. So does she decides to try and go downstairs. Misery style. Misery style. Face, and she, this is where she realises, when she finds the candy, that her face has been scratched out of all the pictures, all the photographs. Yeah. And her sister's true psychoticness here is showing absolutely she falls at the bottom of the stairs yeah she Lady does manage she does manage yeah she does manage to get to her phone but again though like the crap paper airplane and the help me she's really shit at explaining on the phone the situation why doesn't she start with i've been fed a rat that's it one sentence and i'm gonna go what's that my sister drinks 10 bottles of rum a day and is trying to get me to eat a budgie in a wrap. Please upstairs. help me. Uh, she's gone out. I've just got to the phone. I'm laying on the floor. She's trying to feed me a budgie and a rat. But she doesn't. She goes but and beats around the bush. This is a terrifying scene because she's lying on the floor on the phone talking to the doctor and behind her, the door opens and Baby Jane walks in. Now, we as an audience see this, but... Joan Crawford has heard the door for sure because something in her face changes. Amazing acting here. But between both of them, in fact. And this scene is terrifying because Joan Crawford knows that she's the her. She carries on with this conversation with the doctor on the phone. Mm. And then all of a sudden, baby Jane smashes her head into the wall and then she just kicks her around the room like she's a football. Yeah, it's... It's about five kicks. Yeah, it's pretty crazy here. 
I, I noticed something with the score. You have a score which starts off with these notes. Dun, 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 as these notes. And it's very, very reminiscent to the little song that Gene Wilder and his newly married wife in Haunted Honeymoon sing. OK. Uh, the tune's the same. I'm wondering if they took it from this where because it's like it's when his mind's cracking in the Could movie be. Hmm. i think it is yeah interesting just side bit there noticed. well apparently um in a lot of countries they cut this scene right down so that she only kicks her once or twice right but in the the the, the, the episode in the um full version which you and i both watched um she gets a good five or six kicks into her as well as smashing her head against the wall. So, And she managed to get... Oh, the, oh yeah, it's pretty full on. She managed to get a hold of the Doctor and the Doctor agreed to come along. Uh, uh, but then we get the Impressionist back again on the phone ringing yeah. back the Doctor. And she says, oh, that was a mistake. It's all fine. She's going to another Doctor now. Don't worry. I don't need you now. He's like, oh, are you sure? She's like, yeah, it's fine. Um, don't worry about it. But it's obviously it's not her. It's... Yeah. Betty doing Joan's voice, yeah. and then she just drags Joan's body out of the room, her unconscious body out of the room, and and uh, then goes out and uh, basically meets, bumps into the cleaner, and says like, "We yeah. don't need you anymore. Give the keys." Oh, I've got You're the keys. Fired. And she's like, "What? I want to say goodbye to your sister." No, nope. no. Nope. And straight away, I was like, "Is this a plan not to keep those keys?" And I was like, "Yeah." She's definitely like, "I'm already suspicious." And now you're just doing that because as soon as she gave the gave her a day off, I was like, "What's the plan? You can't." You, the reason you've done this is because you've locked her in up there, not giving her food. You know that she's going to tell on you. What's the plan? Do you plan on killing your sister before the cleaners there next week? What is the actual plan? I don't think she has one. I don't think it's that premeditated, even though that contradicts what I said earlier. Saying like, you know, all she knows is she's got, uh, she's given herself a week of breathing and space. I, don't, I guess there isn't a plan there because it's just like what you could do then. So, so the next option is though, fire the cleaner so the cleaner's not going to come back anymore, mm. giving her more time, I suppose, to for Blanche to slowly die. I don't but know. thank God, Elvira, as I've said, one of one of my favourite characters, Elvira, sticks around because while Blanche, uh, while um, Betty Davis goes off to draw out loads of money from the bank. Yeah. Uh, Avira does have a key and she yes. sneaks back into the house. Yep. She goes up to the locked room and she realizes that Blanche is locked in the room. Um, Baby Jane gets home and confronts her. Mm. Avira manages to open the door and what does she see inside the room, Gav? This is like signing out a fucking hostel. It's horrible. I was like, what the hell? Or a saw movie or something? This, is, like, this, this is 1962. Is... This is like, yeah, this is like, whoa, whoa. Like, this woman's tied of her wrists, tied together, bound together, hanging up from, coming down from the ceiling. She's got a mouth gag on, and she's sitting up in bed. That's worse. Not even laying down, just sitting up in bed, just sitting there, like, with his arms pulled, like, not in a comfortable position in any way. And it's just a bit unexpected. It's a bit yeah. like, whoa, that's... Like, apart from the fact that she she can't walk... It's just that is pretty full on. <laughs> it definitely pushes this movie more towards the horror. Well, yeah, this is classed as horror, so it's the other one actually. Um, a way it's less thriller. Um, but poor old Elvira, she did have to use a hammer to open the door. Well, yeah, because she found the buzzer outside. She's like, "Whoa!" and the door's locked. Yeah, so she has a hammer in her hand, but she puts it down. She does. She um... gets the key out because Betty gets back. Betty comes back basically, sees the neighbour. Neighbour says, oh, "I saw you clean the garage." What? She goes in there, approaches her. It was all again at this point. I'm thinking of going up the staircase. I'm back to Psycho. I'm back to Bates Motel. You know, it's a very, very like parallels i don't know if it's a black and white scenery or the staircase or what but at any point i know she's gonna lose it like norman you know and joan crawford tries to warn blanche with her eyes because she's got a gag but unfortunately elvira gets hammer time it's hammer time again MC Hammer is loving his place. He's out with shiny pants, dancing around where she drinks, and she hammers cleaners in the head. She does. And then, just after she hammers her in the head, the buzzer goes, and it's Edwin, the pianist. He's decided to say, I fucking live here when I'm pissed. 
Yeah, he's the the police. Is this when the police have brought him back? Yeah, he's yeah. smashed. Ah, I'm pissed. Yeah, I told you I lived there, and she just goes in there. Are they like? Are they like thinking? Is that his mum, or is that? Is this some? Is this some hilf thing going on here? Well, she pulls Elvira's body out using the wheelchair, um, and this is where she bumps into Mrs. Bates, the neighbour. But she gets away. She's got away with it all because she's Betty Davis. She gets away with it so far. Um, he, 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 but by the way, the, the drunken kid, he, he's the drunken guy, he's walked in there, he's seen Blanche tied up, and yeah, he's so, just in absolute fucking shock, and he just runs out of there. Yeah, we're jumping ahead a little that, bit here, but that, I mean, that he does sobers, come in with the cops. That sobers, that sobers you up, doesn't it? It does indeed, if you go upstairs and see that. But he does sort of, he runs away, which is a bit disappointing. I'm not really sure why he runs away. A shock, I guess. I guess, yeah. Um, BJ tells Blanche they need to run away. We can run away. Let, let me untie you. Um, and Joan Crawford says, "Oh, we need to talk about the accident." And Joan and Baby J says, "Look, I don't want to talk about the accident. It was. It's all blurry. It's all blurry in my head. Let's. Ju- we just need to go. We need to go." And this is the um, twist, isn't it? This is the twist. Yeah. Go on in. Do you want me to jump to that bit now? Yeah, do the twist. Okay, so the twist is, is that it was actually Joan Crawford that wanted to run over Betty Davies. So Blanche running over baby Jane. Yeah, so she was jealous of her and she got out to open the gate to the house and she decided, I'm just going to put my foot down in the accelerator and run you over. For a start, how on earth do you break your own spine by driving into some gates? Yeah, she flipped the car and smashed the car up. How? We couldn't be going that fast from what we saw. Anyway, regardless of that, well, that's just that's just silly to think that. Um, I this is when my Columbo head comes on. Did then the producer because they were going to go to a party to his producers and he said, "Can you might have words with her because we need to not have her sister anymore." Did they come up with a plan? Did she go, like, you know, you give a lot of money, we get out of this. Did she come up with her own plan and go, like, if I paralyse her, she's fucked. And she fucked, she got karma and fucked herself up. Yeah, maybe karma. Well, it's karma, isn't I it? think it's because she's told to get her out of the contract. I think it's like, she's like, mm, if I don't do this, I'm going to... Even though in the movie she doesn't come across like an evil sort of person, and Betty Davis comes across crazy, but poor old Betty Davis, baby Jane, bit this whole time being told this l- lie has fucked her up. I know, it does give it a bit, a little bit of sympathy to the character, doesn't it? Bit, even yeah. though she's, Even though she's really nasty... But she's been driven that w- that way because, if you pardon the pun, because yeah. because she was driven to drink, which has therefore deteriorated her mental health, which has made her really violent and horrible and nasty and, and drunk, because she was under the impression that she crippled her sister. Yeah. And all this time, sickly sweet, but I wouldn't melt in her mouth, Blanche. See, it's, oh, knew I didn't oh. like her. Oh, I'm so lovely, and I'm in a wheelchair. Yeah. But actually, you deserve to be there in some ways. It was because... your karma for going, oh, I'm that. And I do think, my Columbo head came on, and I do think definitely it was planned in her head before, this is how I'm going to do it. Well, they, um, Baby Jane thinks, Edwin the penis is going to grasp me up, so let's get out of here. So she drags her out, chucks her in the car, and they go for a drive. And she talked earlier about one of her favourite times in her life was do it was practicing dan- a dance on the beach with her dad, and everyone was gathering around to watch Baby Jane Hudson, all, um, you know, rehearse on the beach. So she kind of wants to re, re, you know, revive that memory. So she takes her to the beach, her sister who can't walk, you know, and not the point, point she's not even eaten much she over the last week. She looks like she's dead, just in <laughs> his blanket dead. on the beach. Each no, time I'm like, has she died? That's it, because I'd never seen this before. I thought, uh, several times, I, I thought, remember. that's just a corpse. Yeah. That is just a corpse. I was yeah. like, she's, she's, she's dead, like, each time. And then all of a sudden, she moves her face over to the other side. So, whoa! Well, well, they get to the beach late at night, and there's no one there at the time. And then in the morning... Um, uh, Baby Jane goes for a, a splash. She plays with some kids but in the there's water. There's a little ice cream like parlor, and uh, the radio's playing. Yeah, the radio's playing up there, and she goes up to order some ice creams. And there's some cops up there, 
and uh, they've been told there's there's a car that's been that's parked out in the middle of the road for some reason, and it matches the description of uh, Baby Jane Hudson because it's all over the news. The, the cleaner sisters are on the run. Was found dead. Yeah, and it was their cleaner, and all of a sudden the sisters on the not on the they know one of them's probably in need because of help because it was obviously the paralysed person, um, uh, and the doctors know of obviously Baby Jane's conditions. So, yeah, they've put two and two together, basically. And they go run down to the car, and lo and behold, it's the car. It is. So they then they spot Letty Davies with her ice creams. Well, beforehand, while, while card, old baby Jane was making sandcastles, while, her, yeah, while, of she is. while without even acknowledging the fact that her sister's there dying, and how hor- This is another bit of the movie, which makes it a horror movie. There's a woman dying around people having fun. And they, and they don't, don't even notice. notice. Yeah. Uh, well, they follow her over and they sort of surround her. And all the, and it's in her head. They've all come to see her rehearse like she did when she was a kid. So all these people gather around her. So she just starts dancing like a maniac uh, to uh, these people. Well, just before that, she is told of this, what happened with the car and snapping and the spine and all that stuff. Um, just as while well, she's oh, on yeah, the beach, that's where the twist yeah. is and, to... and this is where she's like, this whole time I could have we I, we could have been more friendly, and this and it is this whole time, and I think at that point she's kind of set free, and she's like, oh great, and she goes back to her childhood again, and yep. let me go get some ice creams for me and you, not noticing the fact that she's dehydrated, starving, mal- malnutrition, it, she's on the verge of death. And it's so, like, unfortunately, Baby Jane does have mental issues. And, and, and Blanche block. says Blanche says to her, it's my fault that you're like this. It's my fault that you're ugly. I made you ugly. And she doesn't mean ugly as in the way she looks. She means, I've made your, your soul ugly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's... Um... It's crazy, but it's, yeah, so she goes and gets the ice cream pies and the cops spot her and they're like, oh, well, whoa, whoa, we've been looking for you. Where's your sister? We need me. And they can, they're treating her, even though they kind of probably know that she's killed or done something to the cleaner. They know that, that to treat her sort of gently. Where's your sister? We just need to know. We don't want to panic her. And then the, we get this wide aerial shot looking down of all the crowd go around her and she takes that as her being on stage again and disillusioned yeah. and she just starts dancing. It's like fucking Leatherface at the end of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but without an ice, a chainsaw, it's an ice cream. So two things are happening in this final shot. You've got the two cops spot Joan Crawford lying on the beach near dead, and then you've got a group of just strangers gathering around Betty Davis, watching her spinning around and around and around in a main, maniac stance. All I can say is wild card. And that is the end. And my last word of my notes after that is just the word... Whoa, because that's quite the ending. And uh, blew that's me away. how it ends, because we don't... It, I'd like to maybe just a little bit more... In, uh, no, I do like the ending. But I'd like to almost a little bit maybe just to give us a bit more like, is she going to die or not? But it's up to our interpretation <laughs> if yeah. she dies or lives. And it's, yeah, uh, thumbs up. Definitely recommend this movie if you've not seen it. Um, you know, don't be put off by its length and it being in black and white and old. Yeah, it flies by. It's fantastic performances. It's, I've never seen it yeah, before. It, it's a it's a real good film if you're gonna sit and watch it. Yeah, it's a really it's yeah. one of the best high exploitation movies. So thank so, you, Jamie, for so getting. Thank us you very that. much for that. Um, right, let's do a jump. Bill. Oh, there he is. Bill, Bill. do you wanna? Come here, do some word of the strange. Yeah? No? Come on, Bill. Come on. Here we go. Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. World of the Strange. Strange. Strange world. World of the strange. <laughs> world of the strange. World of the strange. So, I only have one story. Yeah. Okay. Jack um, and Ori. Jack and Ori. What's the story? Morning Glory. Oh, and Balamori. 
is the headline. Eleven children used a Ouija board at school, then vomited so hard they all collapsed. Whoa! Is this real? It's real, man! Yes, this is real. That's crazy. So, is it, what, what country is this? This is in Colombia. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, ag uh, an agricultural technical institute in Hato, Colombia. They were all taken voodoo to hospital. Magic, man. Voodoo magic. Fucking voodoo magic. I said that thing, didn't I, I discovered yesterday. King yeah. Willie. King Willie, King who Willie does from voodoo Predator magic. Too. He was, uh, he's Calvin Lockhart, who was um, the main guy from The Beast Must Die. Which is the Who Done It Werewolf movie. Which has in it the gentleman with the long blonde hair lives in my town and he's my friend's oh, right. dad which is really weird it's a good movie though mm, I need to watch it again I was actually thinking maybe we could cover that yeah. murder mystery horror we could or just we'll do another werewolf episode that's true if we're, doing, if we're talking about Jamie this episode we could have to do another me. werewolf yeah mm. well werewolf movies are actually murder mysteries we could do the other one which came out the one with the, the sheriff new to the town oh uh, yeah that's a murder werewolves. mystery werewolf movie. Maybe we werewolves should do those. Us or Let's something. do a werewolf murder mystery episode. I love that idea. That's fantastic. And if I can, I'll see if I can at least get the gentleman to say hello. Podcast, Just hello. Hello. You listen to the podcast or oh, I was in the Beast Must Die, you know. Amazing. He used to go in the playground. I'd be like, look at that. But yeah, didn't realise at first, eh? Until she said, and I was like, oh my God. But yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Anyway. Columbia, Ouija board, 11 children. Okay. So, a group of children collapsed after using a Ouija board at their school. The teenagers are said to have been discovered by teachers in a corridor at the Agricultural College in Hato, Columbia. They reported that the 13 to 17 year olds, so quite a range of ages there, had all suffered from violent vomiting, abdominal pains, and muscle spasms. Okay. That's crazy. Most of them were dealt with at a nearby health centre, but five of them had to be taken to hospital. The youngsters spent the day receiving medical treatment, and a medical report later said most of them suffered from a rare form of food poisoning. Oh, so that's what made them vomit. The children were passed out at the time. They were short of breath. There was a thick brown drool coming out of their mouths. Are we just talking about food poisoning? I don't, well, it's Ouija board. You Ouija board. The Colombian authorities have not ruled out that the Ouija board was part of the investigation or part of the problem. Right. And that's all I've got. Oh, right, okay. Well, I... I sorry. I'm sorry that I'm being a scully here. But I am, I am going food poisoning. They just maybe happen to be doing a Ouija board. They said that we did not find any psychological alteration in the children. Um, yeah. They'd been playing with fruit with a, a Ouija board, but <laughs> coincidentally, they may have drunk water from a, either from a stagnant pool nearby or <laughs> ate the same food. <laughs> that's definitely what that's what's happened. Or yeah, they've drank some water and got fucking Wells disease or something. Yeah, this is what the devil wants you to think they're going. Oh, I guess. That's probably what happened. So there we go, that's one of the streets. <laughs> <laughs> that's a quick one. You found nothing about any hags then, which is weird. And anything had to do with hags, really, apart from my mother in law. Hey, 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 hey. She doesn't listen to the podcast, she does she? She doesn't listen to the That's good. good, good. Love you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, so my wife sent me that one um, and said, oh, here's one. And I said, oh, I'll, I'll do that one then. Yeah. And uh, food poison. So what I would say is if you're in Colombia, there's better things to be doing than Ouija boards and getting food poison. And drinking out of a well. Get on some of that Colombian marching powder. <laughs> Talking of which, Bill, do you want to take us out of here? Bill, that was a quick one. <laughs> He's probably thinking, hang on, guys, if I just started drinking, well, tough. Now you're finishing. Come on, finish the show. Let's get dine out of it, here. Dine it, dine it. Let's get out of here. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Careless Pets. Weird. 
When I put those clothes on, something happens to me. Something frightening. From the loneliness and simplicity of an isolated farm to the sophisticated elegance of a country estate, Straight Jacket mounts to a crescendo of electrifying suspense. Sinister. <gasps> Frightening. Bill! Bill! Don't you go in that room! Joan Crawford in a shattering screen portrayal. A frantic woman pressured by straight jacket tension. Leave me alone! You let go of me! Listen to me! Just call me Lucy. I wouldn't like my little girl to think I was trying to take her fellow away from her. Carol and Michael are going to be married! And nobody's gonna stop it! Ingeniously designed to shock and startle, Straight Jacket may go beyond the limits of your ability to endure suspense. Mother! He's gone. Tell me. Oh, my God! The author of the famed novel Psycho, the director of the widely acclaimed chiller Homicidal, the co-star of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, join forces to create a frightening classic of shock and suspense. That was the trailer for Straight Jacket from 1964, which is our next movie. So before Gav gives us the synopsis, here's what Jamie said about it in her email. Um, Straight Jacket came to me many years later. So this is after Baby Jean. Um, but that was gifted to me by my mother, which in retrospect is funny since Joan Crawford in this movie is so much like my mother. <laughs> okay. Except, except oh. for the act. Ah, good, good. <laughs> That, that is what I was hoping for. Uh, and this is a slasher precursor, she says, directed by William Castle and written by Robert Block, no less. Uh, Robert Block wrote some of the Psycho movies. Um, expect, uh, sorry, then she says, um, it never gets brought up, in her opinion, but pay attention and you'll see lots of things that you would see later come into, you'd come to expect from lots of other slasher movies. Plus... It's got George Kennedy in this movie. I, I didn't even realise till like halfway through the movie, and I was like, I know that person. Yeah, Naked and, uh, Gun. Um, that, that's it. So then she finishes her email. So, Gav? After a 20-year stay at an asylum for a double murder, a mother returns to her strange daughter where suspicions arise about her behaviour. I columbo this again. So, this is the William Castle movie. I know. William I... Castle did The House on Haunted Hill. He did 13 Ghosts. He did um, The Old Dark House. Great director. Um, and you had some thoughts on how this film looks and feels Ooh. with regards to that. It just feels like such noir. It's... Um... There's lots of uh, sometimes with noir you, you have these artificial lights where they're not they're not natural lights in the room where where the scene's been lit, and um, this this has a lot of them. So you have these really hard lights and angles and things and shadows and things, and it's just so beautifully done. And it's um quite I don't know I was surprised it was William Castle, um, mm. but very pleasantly surprised by it being William Castle. Um, I think it looks gorgeous, um, and this movie comes across better than the other film because I'm going with uh, the look, and I think this is gorgeous. It really is, and I do like the whole axe murderer thing. That is like it's quite a nice. I do like axe murderers. <laughs> well, it's got a good song in it, which we'll get to as well. And it was written by Robert Block as well, who, as I mentioned, wrote. Uh, Psycho, well, Psycho 2, and a few other... And, and and this opens, going back to William Castle, this opens with a scream like House on Haunted Hill. Mm -hmm. It's William Castle knew those tricks, you know, he was doing those sorts of things. 
Yeah. It also opens with the six million dollar man. Right, yeah. Uh if you know what I mean. But we'll we'll come to that. What should we this this was my second time of watching this. My first. And your first. So I'd weirdly I'd watched this earlier this year, about six or seven months ago. How did you discover it? Uh it was on my list. It was just on my list of ones to watch that I get around to eventually. Okay. I worked my way through it and it came around to it and I watched it. Little did I know I'd be later reviewing it later on in the year. Um obviously uh, Joan Crawford is in this as well. Um it was it's a, a interesting movie. Um I I don't mind the films which start off narration and giving you a massive but like info dump and a backstory. I don't mind films that do that. And this does this and uh, it, again, it always already starts giving you that kind of noirish feel to it, you know. It's kind of feels yeah. like a deep south noir or something. I don't know where it's set, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, I'm not really sure where it's set. But um, yeah, the song in it is—is uh, is it Lucy Harbin took an axe, gave her husband forty wax yeah, when it, she saw what she had done? She gave his girlfriend forty one. Isn't that a play on um, um, that the, uh, lady who they thought was an axe murderer for many years ago, which is never actually proven, actually? Um, uh, but they put her down for it, and they showed they said she was an axe murderer. That woman made movies about her. Oh, I can't. Remember. Um, I think. Do you know what I mean? They've made there's horror movies. Not even that old has been something fairly recently. A woman with an axe and killed her whole family. Yeah, I do know what you mean. Oh, hang on, here we go. Uh, Lizzie Borden. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Lizzie <laughs> Borden. Everybody is screaming at the fucking podcast. And... Yeah, sorry yeah, about that, guys. Lizzie Borden. Uh, and uh, I think that story, uh, that poem sort of comes from her. And it's a bit like the whole, and I'm sure Wes Craven heard that and took it and made the whole, like, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. It's a nursery rhyme about death. So yeah, it's pretty scary. We have a, a a drunken drunken man with a young lady. Going Lee home. Majors, uh, aka before he was Lee Majors. Before he was the six million dollar man. Before he was the, the full guy. Um, he had a different he, name, which couldn't be read, uh, couldn't be said very well. So he changed as Lee Majors. He did, and he's uncredited in this as well. Oh. Um, he obviously is credited it's now. Probably on because of his name, he's probably like, oh, don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, I think Joan Crawford gave him his stage name, or, or was the reason he chose Lee Majors because she couldn't pronounce his name. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a very young man in this, and he is married to Joan Crawford, to Lucy Harbin. Uh, but she's away. So while she's, she's away, away the captain will play. Well, what's he up to? He's in a bar, isn't he? And he's met a young lady. Yep. It's sexy time. Sex is but sex time. This is pretty gross. He takes her home, and the narration says. The only person that was at home was his daughter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he, t he sneaks past his daughter with this woman. Leaves the door open. She's not asleep. She wakes up and watches. Awful. It's not good. I uh, I, I knew a dude when I was in America, and uh, there was a girl just down the road, and he said, oh, yeah, who up that girl? I said, oh, okay, cool. And then, then one day he's like, oh, Shagged it off, so yeah, well, yeah, shagged. he had sex. He was American, he wouldn't have said shagged. Regardless. Um, uh, but she had a young kid, slept in the same room. And, I was, oh, and, and when he told me, I was like, What with her kids? Where's the kid? In the same room. I was like, I'm not into that at all. <laughs> it's just weird, isn't it? That it's seems just, a bit wrong, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, just keep, keep in your pants. You know, fucking hell. Well, Joan Crawford. But yes, this little girl has seen this. And, and guess who else has come home? Joan, Lucy Harbin. She gets home early. She gets off the train nice and early. She thinks, I'll surprise my husband. Oh, he'll like that, because we love each other very much. Mm. Well. It's not what happens. She looks through the window and she sees... She sees his little bottom going up and down. No, he's. they finished by then. <laughs> they, they're just lying there peacefully. But she knows it is uh, post-coitus. And she sees an axe. She goes away distraught and falls over an axe, which was quite handy when it was there. Um, now, one thing before we get to the axe bit, Joan Crawford's got an amazingly... Uh, her face is great at doing expressions. Yeah. The way that she looks through the window and does this, like, expression of, like, I, I'm so hurt, but I'm so angry, but I'm going to kill all at the same time. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then she grabs the axe, and then through the through the medium of shadows, Just... Gav. Oh, see, this is such a good... See, the re- Look, back back if he could have done, William Castle would have filmed the axe and the blood and all that stuff, I feel. Oh, no, later on he does do an axe shot, though. So maybe not. But there's different ways... Because of doing this, though, it's also... You can get away with the MPA and the sensor, and also... Yeah, you'd only be able cheaper. to show one beheading or something, wouldn't you, like yeah, that? Yeah, because you wouldn't have so many heads you could get made, because he is, is a man sort of doing it on the cheap. But it... it it's 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 a cheaper way of doing it, and it's a quicker way of doing it. Just a shadow, <laughs> but it looks so fucking good. And it I was watching brilliant. this film, and because I love black and white movies so much, I was watching this film. and I was like, "That's it." I declared it there and then. I'm making a black and white feature film at some point in my life before I before I'm dead. I've decided because yeah, we, I we can't discussed wait. That. Yeah, yeah, I, and I agree. I think. Just for a bit of what, what's the purpose? You should have already a purpose for everything you do in your movie. Does that have a purpose? I fucking like black and white movies. That's my purpose. Well, the the shot, just to describe it, is what you see is the shadow of her walk into the room. Just with the axe. So it's and very, the axe. You know, the shadow of the axe going up. Down. And it just, you're watching the scene unfold the horror of also, it by shadow. The budget, the budget is better because it's cheaper, because all you need to do is see the shadow of the better. head roll off. And, it and it's just, more impactful. It's, yeah, it's great. And you can just put a fucking cabbage there or whatever, and it just drops off. 20 years later, because this has all happened in front of Carol. Poor little Carol. So that night, she's seen her dear daddy boning a woman that isn't her mama. You have uh, these three shots, uh, three sort of storylines all dissolving in with each other. So you've got these layers of these different shots. So it's showing the kid's reaction. You're showing the woman being taken away, who's done this, Joan Crawford. And just and just uh, the husband and stuff and all of this all at once going over and over and over showing you what's going on and yeah that poor girl like that is fucked yeah oh poor uh, um, Carol uh, Carol <coughs> twenty years later twenty years later they release Lucy from the asylum where she's been all this time. She killed two people, Gab. Let her out, though. She fucking did, Dan. She fucking killed... She fucking locked their fucking heads off. Off she goes. Go and live with your daughter, Carol. Get the man some eggs. <clears throat> Crazy. So, we get the, uh... The credits now, which is... Amazing, weird, crazy paintings and images that just come up. Basically, showing you the inside of Lucy's head. Like, what what is going on? Like... Yeah. What's been happening for the last twenty years in this asylum? I I, I <clears throat> call this um I, like again at Columbo. I called this movie from very early on. What the what was going on? Did, it was quite obvious. I found, but only probably because I've seen this sort of story before, kind of a bit. Did you Did you know what's going on? No, not the first time. But obviously, because oh. I'd only watched this a few months ago, <clears throat> this time around, oh, I yeah, of course you knew. Yeah. watched it from a different perspective because I. So I was watching things carefully, if yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, Mum arrives home, and there's sort of a strange hug between them because they haven't seen each other properly for twenty years. And obviously, last time I saw you, Mum, you were lopping off heads. Very quickly, just before that, beautiful shot, really, really wide shot of uh, the car driving along past telegraph poles, and just the black and white. So you've got those black poles just there really wide shots really gorgeous i love that you can make yeah. you can have it as a picture on your wall it's really it feels nice. this film feels like it had less it's, of a budget than the other one but but, but it's very beautiful like the person who shot it, it has gone like right well what can we do we don't have much money and yeah i think they've looked at possible really possible possibly looked at european movies maybe french films of the time and just been like yeah let's just Real high, hard shadows, you know. And he he knew how to stretch a budget as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, House on Haunted Hill is just he just found a, 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 re- a weird looking building house and said, "Oh, we're filming there," and just made it. You it's know, really, just I love that movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, strange hug between them. There's tears. They haven't seen each other in many many years. Well, there's no tears at first. At first. 
because she walks in there and she sees her kids like oh you're all grown up and it's quite an emotional scene she's going in to see and it's the last time we saw each other her mum was taken away from her her last thing is like you've taken my father away from me i understand why you did it but you did and then you were taken away how horrible are you a person to take my parents away do you know what i mean it yeah. was very selfish to just go right that's it out of anger and it's like if she blew up like that like killing someone because that's like cr- you know it's only a matter of time again i was like it's gonna happen was she always gnarly did she blow up like this before but anyway well, regardless it's a very emotional scene and she doesn't know how to react to the mum but she does come around and starts to move her hands on the back a little bit and they embrace and she says let me show you around the farm where, where i live now yes, yes. so she shows her the pigs. It's a nice secluded film as well. We're kind of stuck out here. Kind of like yep. a love movie, actually. It's single locations as well, though, isn't it? You go out to this, rent out a farm, and you shoot at a farm, it's cheaper. But it works great. It, isolation, being locked off from people. I like the bit we get a doctor come out, and, like, it's very much, very similar to the other film in some ways. So the, on this farm is, is obviously Carol um, and her uncle Bill, which is Lucy's brother uh and his wife emily and they're obviously uh, looking out for his sister uh and want her to come along and get well you know uh, and they've got a farm hand played by george kennedy who we mentioned earlier george kennedy the young george kennedy must be like very what, 22 23 maybe quite hunky actually he didn't really like in the um the naked gun movies obviously every scene he's in he's the guy from naked gun who is always constantly and every scene he's eating a cake, a banana. He's just a constant. He's great. Thing. Uh, he's is, very funny. He's in uh, uh, that bear movie too. Uh, one of them. Grizzly? <clears throat> no, I don't know if it's Grizzly. George. George Fingmaji is in. Oh, well, I don't know. Anyway. The, the, uh, the, one, the one, the day of the. Day um, of the animal. animals? Yeah, that one. No, because that's the Leslie Nielsen wrestling bear one. <laughs> Oh lot, man, I don't a lot know. Of bear movies out there. <laughs> Bo, uh, but yeah, tell so us which George, ones. George Kennedy plays Leo, who's like the farmer hand. He seems a bit dumb, uh, but yeah. he knows what's going on at the same time. He, so. he, uh, he, well, <coughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if he knows. He, well, he knows criminal con- uh, 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 stuff. Possibly could be going on. Um, uh, we also have like an earlier one. Just looking at. Again, it was interesting. It's like the other movie. They were looking at the chicken cage for no reason to be. For me, I felt more like being being stuck still, slightly being caged up. I don't know. I'm looking into that again, possibly like I was before. The other one definitely felt like a more proper metaphor. Um, but this one, but she seems quite emotionally stable. She or mentally stable, doesn't she? She does, but unfortunately, Carol keeps using the word slaughter. She keeps saying, this is where we it's slaughter like the pigs. This is where we kill the chicken. Trigger words, almost. It's very, very sneakily triggered words. Yeah, very good. I didn't notice that. Um, and, of course, there's lots of sharp objects lying around the farm as well. <clears throat> Axes, knives, knitting needles, uh, you know. Things, or... that get, yeah, things that you could use to hurt someone. Her daughter is also an artist and has a little bit of moderate success in the art world. Yeah, she's all right. And she really wants her mum to meet her new fiancé, Michael, who will be the love of her life. They're going to be married. I want you to meet her. But before, meet him. But before that, mum. Look what I've made you. I've made you a bust of your head. Yep. And it's this really good likeness of her head. Which. Makes her cry, doesn't it? Scooby Doo fans, let's take notice of everything. But she does sort of get teary and say, wow, you really captured me when I was younger and, and pretty, it's, prettier. it's such a shame because obviously we know what's going to go on with that. But we won't give it away just yet, lovely as if you haven't seen this movie. There's a twist to come. But she says, mum, you are still beautiful to me. You are still that woman. Mm. Um, and they start to reconnect. They go through photo albums. Mum, <laughs> you, know you know when sound and sometimes <clears throat> smell gives you memory, but sometimes sound does. Guess what? I've kept for you your jangly bracelets. The last yeah. time you wore these was when you're jangling an axe over your head before you jingle, locked jangle. off my father's head. Oh, jingle jangle, jangle bracelets. Jangle. Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm the predator, <laughs> Arnie. I'm coming for you. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so when they start to look at the photo albums, and she's got sort of the bracelets and that, she has to sort of take a night. Mum, take. 
put the knife down for no reason at all during Crawford just without thinking about it just picks up a big knife it's because she's, she's watching the beef joint be sliced and she's like ah knives knives I'll have a good knife yeah they have a roast dinner I was, um, car. the last time I was at Sarah's I was having a shower and I just had like Spotify on or something like that and all of a sudden I was in the shower and what came on bloody psycho music yes the shower possibly. scene came on while I was in the shower I was like well this is appropriate amazing yeah did anything else happen, or were you right? That's it. Okay. No, no men came in with wigs on. Or... No, that's a weird thing to happen. I'm in having a shower. I don't well, want to see that. That's what happens in Psycho. Yeah, I guess it's not sexual. It's not good either, though. Well, it's not never sexual unless it's Vince Vaughn, as we know. Oh, Pe- peeping, little peeping. Uh, so yeah, they have a race dinner. Michael arrives. We get, Mum gets to meet Michael. Um, Is this a Johnny man that goes upstairs to fight moths? Sorry, what? There's a jolly man that comes in and goes upstairs to fight off moths. He says, I'll go off oh, no, and that, fight off the uncle. moths. That's uh-huh. her uncle. That's yeah. her uncle. Right. That's Uncle Bill. He's all right. He oh, is. you're on about the fiancé. Yeah, I'm on around. about Michael. Um, but they have the roast dinner. They're coming up. Michael arrives. Mother's wandered off, though. Where's she gone? She was here Where? a minute ago. Where's Mother gone? Oh, why is, where's my photo? Oh, there's a photo album with a knife sticking out of it. I was straight away like, I know what's going on. And also, all the heads have been cut off. It is a Scooby-Doo episode. This is a Scooby-Doo episode. But she doesn't say anything about that. The next day, in fact, Carol says, Mum, we're going to go clothes shopping. Let's shop till we drop, Mum. Let's go for it. Also, Mum, getting you a wig. Getting you a wig and doling you up like how you used to be, love. Going to get you out on the town. Get you You're some... going to look 20 years younger, man. Get you some cock. Yep. Yeah. Can I get you on Tinder? Here we go. You're going to be riding. You can never know. You, know, you, can... you might want some minge. All you sorts. never know. You have Joan it all Crawford at once. Get it all. Yeah. Joan Crawford was hot, man, back in the day. Ooh. She is quite a pretty lady, yeah. Um, CS so yes, gets the wig, and Joan... Uh, Oh, Joan Hears. Joan, sorry, Joan Crawford. If now, Joan Lucy. Crawford, a hottest, was here now, right now, obviously you're not married. This is a weird weird scenario I'm dropping you in here. She was weird here now, but she's black and white like in the movies. Yeah. Would you do her, but she's black and white? Even hotter black and white, I would say. It's a bit weird, though. You're doing it. She's completely you black scenario, and white. Why are you telling me the scenario's weird? You made it up. Well, I didn't think you'd go along with it. Of course. Yeah. Horny old dog, aren't you? Um, so, as she steps out of the shop, the wig shop, feeling good about herself, she suddenly hears, Lucy Harbin took an axe, gave her husband 40 wax. When she saw what he had done, she gave her girlfriend 41. And she's um, just like, what the fuck? Looks outside and it's some kids, but they're actually singing London's Bridge. Yeah, they're saying something different. And again, we know later on what's going on here. It's very well done for the mix and her not to realise the difference. It's a bit of scream almost here. Yeah, like I said, a Scooby Doo Scream is pretty much a Scooby Doo episode. It is. Oh, Scream is like the best Scooby Doo episode of all time, isn't it? The first Scream movie, definitely. I I do love that first Scream movie. I've heard that the fifth Scream film. They're making Scream 6, aren't they? Yeah. It's I've heard wasn't f- good enough. Very good. Oh, uh, I've heard that the fifth one is quite good, but I've heard a few people mentioning this. I'll check it out again. I might have just been having a bad day. But I don't think so. I haven't got, I'll have to get around to it at some point. Anyway, you're right. They're singing London Bridge is Falling Down, and she dreams of the nursery rhyme that night, so it's getting in her yeah, sight. Is now. she losing it? So, yeah, it is dropping in because she wakes up with heads in her bed and an axe in her bed. It's... Now, we all dream of waking up to head in bed. It's not the sort of head you want in bed. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> but, yeah, so she screams. She says to her brother Bill, you know, come this, everybody come in here. And yes, we'll all go in the room and see the, the heads together. Come I, on. I've done it again in here. I've got a Haunted Honeymoon reference in here as well. Really, really fucking <laughs> weird. But it's like what they're trying to do with Gene Wilder in Haunted Honeymoon, they're trying to scare him to death. It's like yeah. that in this, because I figured out what was going on and they're trying to scare her. It's like that. But well, succeeding. if you remember rightly in Jamie's email, she said, you will see things in these two films that are like the blueprints for lots of things. 
in slashers and other movies. So oh, especially she, this one. Think, this is an axe murdering movie. This is this is the one. Yeah. This is like yeah. This is this is almost there is some scream in this. Definitely, mm. you know, there's some of that meta. There's there's definitely something going on here. Well, you kind of don't even think about it, but it's like murders on axe murderer on the farm. This could be called the crazy axe murdering lady of the farm or something. Do you know what but I mean? Like, but like you said, it could also be a Scooby Doo or it could be a Columbo episode. It that, could be any of these. You know, yeah. it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Because you have this doctor come out, he could be in Columbo. There's nothing better than um, a really good murder mystery where it is hard to gauge what what's going on, but also mm. throw in some like beheadings as well, like. Well, good performances. Well, that's, like that. that was the fun thing when I sort of discovered Giallo's originally. Uh, that they were the murder mysteries, but they were taken extreme with gore. Um, so, you know, quite fun. But yeah, this this is this is yeah, like I'm saying, like uh, this is that sort of movie, but like a quarter protege or, or an early blueprint. So Uncle Bill and everybody else all goes. It let we'll all go in the bedroom and all look for the decapitated heads. Come on, and this oh, is look, straight away. Right it's not there, and I knew that they could come out and say, "Look, come on, it. It's not here." Because obviously it'd be game over if it did. The end of the movie would be a lot shorter. But it's just like okay, I know what I've been thinking is definitely, definitely going on, absolutely. And I'm sure audience, you know what's going on. So the next day, everybody is worried about Mum's sanity, about Jane Crawford's sanity. She walks into a barn. This doesn't help, and she sees George Kennedy, Leo, who just wants to say to just like explain about how he lops chickens' heads off. Yeah, see what I, what I do here is uh, you got to get it real quick with the axe, and she's just like, hey, Officer, the axe. Do you not have you not been prepped? Who this lady is? She killed. People with she an killed axe. the six million offer dollar man. The first thing, All right, lady, oh, I've not seen you on this farm for. Want to have a god, my axe? She killed the bionic man. No one can kill the bionic man. She did it with an axe, Gav. Is he the million dollar man too? He was, he's the six million dollar man. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, six million. The, the, there was the bionic woman, was his cousin or sister or something, but. Right. I, sometimes I call him the bionic man, but really he's the six million dollar man. Uh, although six million dollars wouldn't buy you a lot these days, really. Is it like a big, oh, I do remember it. It's kind of a bit like a burly uh, Inspector Gadget, I guess, really. Yeah, he was like Inspector Gadget. He fought, he fought um, Bigfoot in one episode, Sasquatch, played by Andre the Giant, played Sasquatch in that episode. Why are we not covering that? I'm, I'm, I'm going to start Patreon our own episode so we can <laughs> do that. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, anyway, back to... I knew we were going to talk about the six million dollar man in this. Offer, uh, offered, often an axe murderer being often an axe to hold. Yeah. Well, the chicken is killed, and I did worry at one point. She does shake, though a <laughs> hand shake when she's got the axe, and she takes it back, and he's like, oh, "I'm going to kill a chicken." Yeah. I did worry they were going to show a real decapitation of a chicken at this point. I didn't actually. I wasn't. I didn't think they were going to do that actually. Because you know, sometimes they I do that. I know it's that, but I feel this movie feels more stylish. That's cool. Well, the chicken's killed, like you said, and Carol and Michael meet up and they meet his parents before they go to the cinema. And Michael's parents are so rich. They've got Scrooge McDuck money. Very rich. So obviously parents. they're going to be very uh, protective of their son, not thinking that these people would be gold diggers. And they say to Carol, whoa, whoa, Oh, whoa, 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 where's your mum been then? What's going on? Yeah. Where's she been for 20 years? Oh, she's an invalid. An invalid? Where, whereabouts? Doesn't matter, okay. Mum, says her son. Okay, is there a nursery rhyme about her? No, absolutely not. So they leave. Thing. The mum's there, so oh, 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 gossiping. Yeah. And the dad, obviously, he said, Dan, have you ever drank milk to make you calm, not angry? No, but why does he say this? I have no idea. If you're very... Look, if you're stressed out, just have a nice just a glass, glass of milk. Of milk. It'll calm you down. Well, well, since when does milk bring to calm you down? <laughs> if I'm... What if calming calm properties? Down, a drop of whiskey will do the trick normally. I guess warm milk when you're younger, you'd have like a, oh, a cup of warm milk, but... An, an oval team before bed. I haven't had oval team for years. Yeah, it's not very nice tasting anymore, I Is it not? Think. That's why I never think... buy it, because I never think, I think it's going to be good. And it's like, I don't well, know if my waste. taste buzz changed, but when I was a kid... It, it tasted better. A malty drink. Not into it now. Bit of maltiness in your mouth, Dan. I'd rather have that Nesquik stuff. Yeah. I've, um, got, I've got some of that. Brilliant scene coming up here. 
because we got Michael is going to meet uh, Lucy now. He's going to meet his future mother-in-law. And she gets drunk. And basically, she almost gets the tits out. She basically starts sucking him off. She may as well just take her vagina out. It is insane. She gets hammered, and she starts sort of leet all up in his face. Going, well, you know. <laughs> and and after a while, her daughter's like, Mum, and she's like, oh, sorry. Almost Carol, forgot I, you were there. I forgot you were in the room. <laughs> yeah, because she's pissed off, and it's just like, and the, the, but the son, it's really weird. I'm thinking, oh, the son's obviously not like, uh, but then it, he sits down, and he's kind of looking at her like a, uh, uh, and it's a bit like, is he kind of, if she wasn't there, his fiance, and it was her fiance, and he was in the bar, would he, you know? Or is he thinking, am I going to get a little mother daughter sandwich here? I, he's definitely not thinking he's a sandwich filler for a mother and daughter like, slice of bread. Like Machete, when he gets the, True. the mother and daughter. Linda, Linda, uh, Linda Lasardi. Lindsay, it wasn't Linda Lasardi, it was Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay Lohan, not Linda Lasardi, Paige Who Schumacher the from the 80s. I can't, the, I can't remember who the mum was in that, but. Machete. And, uh, Machete. Um, no, I don't think that, <laughs> but it does. It is, but weird his reaction to it. F- fingers on his lips and everything, isn't she? She's flirting she's like shit. I think there's flirting. She's a level above. She is pissed. Um, but there's a phone call, and it's Doctor Anderson, and he's coming. And she's got her jangly bracelets on. She freaks out like, "Who the fuck's rang up my old shrink and is getting him to come down here? Who, who was it?" Why and is everyone's he coming? like, "None of you." So she runs to her brother, like, "Who did it? Find out for me." And he's like, "Chill out. It's probably nothing." Well, if you've been locked up for twenty years, your shrink's probably going to check up on you. Yeah, and he says he's passing on a fishing trip. I, because he turns up, I like it here. It's my safety blanket, Dan. It's when the cops turn up. It's that little bit, you're like, oh, okay, cool. I don't think he's, I don't, I know he's going to get killed, but I like him coming into it because he's a a trained professional. He can see things others can't see, and he does start to notice things. That's why he sends the brother and his wife out. Well, he questions Joan. He says, look, everyone get out. Joan. Joan Crawford, talk to me. I how, think, how do you feel you, your head is? Where's your head at? her and her brother are both actually quite happy that the doctor actually turns up and the phone call wasn't her imagination, though. Because I think they're both like, yeah, I don't think your doctor did come. Is that just, did you imagine that phone call? Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Um, but it, obviously I couldn't imagine the phone actually ringing. It did ring. But um, I felt like, so I was kind of relieved a little bit and I felt like she was just a bit like, oh, thank God, I'm not actually going crazy. The doctor is actually here, even though I don't really want him here. Well, she doesn't want to talk to him. She ends up stabbing her knitting needles into the ground and storming off. Uh, and he goes off to try and find her. He goes into the barn and he is chopped up in the barn with an axe. But before before we get to that, you're way jumping ahead here because this is an amazing bit, which I was like, I, I, if I could LEG finger click, I would have done. I stopped it, we round it back because it was so fucking rad and she looks so fucking badass. I have never seen someone so badass on cinema from the shot that I saw when she lit a cigarette off a record playing. The record scratches as she strikes it and lights yeah. up a cigarette. That was the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> I ran that back. It was so that, fucking that, dope. That bit reminded me of another cool cigarette lighting bit, which is in um, The Devil Rides Out, which is when... Christopher Lee rocks up to that party at the beginning and his mate's like, oh, you shouldn't be here. Um, this is my special astronomical club and you need to leave. And Christopher Lee says to his friend, well, this isn't what what he's telling us it is, so we'll stick around until they actually physically kick us out. He leans over and lights a cigarette off a candle when everyone's staring at him. He just blows smoke in everyone's face as he's walking around. So this was almost as good as that. Okay. And no, actually, no, I do think John Greg Crawford is better, actually. It's, it's, it's because it's it's very, very unexpected. Obviously, the square record scratch they put in post is very unexpected the way she just... It's it just goes like, to show like, that... Oh, the style that I she's think what it, what, flowing. What that says is, is we, we don't know about her backstory. She's lived a different life before. She got married and had a she kid. cool as fuck, man, when she Something, that. Yeah, something cool. It's 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 almost like when a cowboy lights um, on the, off their beard with a match or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or the bottom of their shoe. I've never been able to do any of that. I'm not that. I, cool. I, I, I used to be able to do the old finger, just match up with your finger. Oh wow, I couldn't do that. 
Yeah, I learned to do it a little bit. And uh, on my teeth. Jesus Christ, you're you're almost like as cool as Jen Crawford. I'm like a cool cowboy. You are a cool cowboy. Or Riding Jen Crawford. Cowboy. <laughs> um, you're my reverse cowgirl. I'll call you that. So, Dr. Anderson is chopped up in the barn. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the doctor goes wandering off because she runs out. He goes walking, looking for her. And, yeah, we knew it was going to happen. We thought we everybody knew it. As soon as the doctor turned up, it. we knew she, he was getting axed. We do, but we don't see it. It's done very well. Um, Carol, young Carol, sees his car is outside. And uh, there's no sign of him anywhere on the farm. No. And when he was chatting to her... There's another metaphor here. Apparently, Betty Davis was very much very... Uh, Joan Crawford was very much into a knitting. Not Betty Davis, wrong movie. Um, but there's a bit here, here, which is a nice metaphor. She's worried about her knitting while he's chatting to her. And she says, oh, it's all come unraveled and it's fallen apart. And I was like, it's a bit like you at the moment. It's st- You are starting to go that way as well. And I found that quite interesting. A choice of words. She demanded that knitting be a part of this apparently because that was one of her favorite hobbies at the time but i love the fact that those words uh just saying that it's un- it's become unraveled and it's falling apart and i was yeah. like i like that it's very good very good indeed so his car's there on the farm but there is no doctor to be seen um and the next day joan uh crawford lies to her daughter about the doctor very quickly, we didn't see the Doctor be killed by Joan Crawford, just to no. say, just Scooby-Doo enthusiastics out there, just stay with me on this one. Somebody killed him, but we don't know who. Mm-hmm. Shadows again, my friend, shadows. So, yeah, Joan lies to her daughter about the Doctor. She says, look, I can't remember what happened, really. I, I, I did speak to him, but I don't, I don't really remember... Carol calls the hospital and, and uh, she says they won't let. I, she says I don't know where he is. No one knows where the doctor is, but I can promise you something, Mum. I won't let. I won't let them take you back. Don't you worry about that. So then, we're seeing the strange side of her daughter now. She sort of suspects that her mum is doing something bad. Yeah, and is supporting that decision. It's <sighs> she's come. Yeah, this is this is where it's like it's a it's a it's a grey area. She's come back in and she's saying, "Where's the doctor?" And she's saying, "I the doctor's gone." She looks out, she sees the doctor's car still there, so she questions it further. But she's all of a sudden going, "Oh my god, mother, what have you done?" Yeah, which is interesting because she's not doing it for the audience because the audience doesn't exist. This is a story, so if we're saying this is a story actually going on. Is she must still be doing this to what a bitch? She must still be doing this to uh, to wind her mum up. Yeah, to give it a lot, or give it a twist away, guys and girls. Uh, uh, her daughter is basically doing the killing. So is she doing this to? Yeah, she must be doing this to just for her to make her go even more and more like she's going insane. And it's well, such a horrible thing to do. There is a spanner in the works of her plan because Leo decides he likes the Doctor's car and he's going to keep it. Well, he sees it getting put in, put in the barn and he straight away knows it. So he's like, I'm going to take out a barn and start painting it. Over Can we talk it. about the painting, please? I love it. I've never seen anybody paint in a car with a, with a tin of paint and a paintbrush before. Uh, but you're never. guaranteed that's been done. I'm thinking yep. Russia, but I'm guaranteed that's been done. <laughs> What colour should I paint my car? What uh, spray paint? No, just got some um, Dulux vinyl from the DIY shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what you got to do. I, I would do it if I could get away with it. And he's painting it, and she says, "What are you doing?" He says, "Painting my car." She says, "It's not your car." And he says, "I Isn't know, it? I think, like, and I think it is my car." He she- knows. He knows. Criminal things have happened, uh, but is he thinking that doctor's dead? He must well, be. Well. She says to him, yeah, he is, because she says to him, you need to leave, you need to, you're, you're done on this farm. And he's like, he says to her, no, I'm not. Because if I'm done on this farm, I could tell people things that might you might not like me to tell people. So I think I'll be staying on this farm for a long, long time, actually. So he knows he's got her in the palm of his hand, or does he? Um, 
And then he just carries on painting his car with a paintbrush. Very strange. However, he's now opened himself up to be the next victim. So he's wandering around the laundry. The laundry's all sort of blowing. Very good scene, this. Uh, we've seen it a million times before. The laundry, is there someone in there, is there not? And something whips out. Is it an arm, is it not? He doesn't know. He sort of follows it in. Then he ends up going into the barn, doesn't he? He's sort of building up a little bit of suspense as well. So William Castle knows horror. He yeah. goes into the barn. It's dark, and there's a pig hanging up in there, a slaughtered pig. He, he, well, he, he well, past the window, and he, he walks up to his reflection and knocks his head into the window, for fuck's sake. <laughs> idiot. What an idiot. It's you, you penis. Well, then we get a absolutely fantastic beheading really good chop and I rewind it and watched it a couple of times and saw how they did it I did as well Um, it was unexpected yeah I think because (laughs) it's been all shadows for the first couple of times so when it actually showed it it was really well done it was 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 really shocking rule of three and by the third one revealing it it was brilliant but but when you go back and watch it, you see it's quite quite a fake head. But because back back in the day, you wouldn't have been able to rewind this film. It would have you that would have sat with you. Yeah, you come out of there, and you'd have said that beheading was incredible. How did they do that? There's a couple so, of there's a couple of things we've uh, bypassed a little bit. Um, there's a point where uh, um, Joan Crawford has changed clothes. She's gone back to her original clothing because she felt normal. She, uh, she said that other clothing made her feel a bit weird. There's that That's point right. which is going on. We've also had people ringing up from the hospital wondering where the doctor is because he said that he might pass by their house. And obviously this is back in the day where you'd have to ring up and say, oh, is, is the doctor been there? Or is he, you know, cause... Well, that's what I said. Carol Carol did some of the ringing as well. She rang right. them back and she spoke to people and she was like, people, well, they're wondering where he is. And that's where her mum's like, I, I can't remember what happened. And yeah, well, she's knifing up some linen lin paper. <laughs> Well, dinner's planned at Michael's parents, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the daughter's also said, "I won't let you take them. I won't let them take you back, mother." So she's doing this whole sense of security to her mum, but she's the one pushing it. It's the most horriblest thing you could do. It's almost as if it's like such an evil person. She puts across in normal terms that she's so nice and sweet and innocent, but behind the scenes, she is proper, like you know, doing yeah. so bad. A similar relationship that Norman Bates has with his mum, and I use the word mum very loosely here, the yeah, mum again, that lives in his head. Again, the psycho references to this as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, because she's have like... this in movies. I don't know if Jane, uh, Jamie picked this in, in, uh, because they are slightly related, not just because of Joan Crawford or in black and white, but they, in tone and storyline, kind of, they feel very similar in the service, in some way. Well, Joan, Lucy, does not want to go to Michael's parents for dinner. She says, I really don't want to go. They they persuade her and they they drive there. She, and she just doesn't. And she's like, oh, I can't get out the car. I can't get out yeah. the car. Uh, it's very realistic, this. Well, I can... uh, I've been doing this recently with Jay um, um, because obviously we've had, we've had this. Um, uh, we've discovered that Jay's uh, autistic. We've had a, like, a, 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 a proper... Diagnosis. Uh, diagnosis. Thank you. And um, been struggling with Jay. We, this, we found this out from Jay not being able to get out of the car to go to school. So it was really funny watching this. You know, like when you have real life situations and you watch movies, and then you can, oh, you can totally relate to it. And I could totally relate to where she couldn't get out of the car. And I was like, oh my god. Um, and she's just totally freaking out. And and her reasoning is, she, it's it's a few things. She doesn't want to show her real appearance to the. Uh, 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 the, the parent in laws as I don't know what is it what is her her reason she doctor? just very she very just anxious freaks out it's just anx- anx- yeah okay <laughs> I think she feels a bit um, agoraphobic as well because she spent like twenty years locked up in a padded cell yeah there's lots of things really because at this point <clears throat> she starts having a daydream about her padded cell um, and then kind of comes to sat in a little room and you're like what's going on here yeah and then you realise some point during her going in she spilt coffee all over her dress yeah there were daughters that were helping her get changed and cleaned up um and you're sort of oh okay that's that's interesting they didn't really show you that but also 
that must be what it's like if your anxiety is that bad. You almost black out for a moment and come to yeah another part of the house or something. You know, yeah, like, yeah I don't if it's know, that yeah. bad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, she, she does when they go out though. The uh, uh, daughter and the uh, fiance go out. L- Lucy, older. Joan Crawford, she actually talks to the parent in laws and just sort of pretty much says, like, yeah, she wants to get married. So, you know, yeah, I'm, she I'm just going to say this stuff. So, yeah. Where obviously it's not her place to say this. It's like, well, what are you saying? Yeah, because Michael and uh, Carol take off everybody else off to go look at the dairy, which they own, which is part, part of the reason they're so rich. Um, yeah, and she just says, oh, yeah, married. And his parents didn't know. They didn't know they were engaged. They didn't know they were going to be married. They think, why would he marry a very poor woman whose whose mother has potentially been locked away for 20 years? Yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, then she she starts just kind of, this is where we get into loose cannon style. She starts to lose it a bit and goes up to and says, I don't care anymore. And that's how it was. And you, all, I always thought the, the mother-in-law to be was uh, going to be sympathetic. But no, no, she's like, don't touch me. Yeah, and his parents say, we do not want this marriage at all. Um, where have you been for the last 20 years? They sort of demand to know. And she says, I've been in a hospital. And they're like, we heard it was a sanitarium, an yeah. asylum. Um, yeah, where, where if someone said that now, you'd be like, oh, OK. Like, <laughs> and you'd be like sympathetic, you'd think. You'd like to think. Yeah. Instead, we get a mother versus mother screaming match. Oh, God. Mother versus mother-in-law. And it's at one point she says, you don't know, I've been through 20 years of pure hell. Again, Joan Crawford delivering these lines being amazing. Um, And uh, Michael's mum says, but you're insane. Um, And she says, I don't care what you think of me. I'm determined that my Carol will marry will marry Michael, and she'll get everything that she wants and everything that she deserves, all the happiness. And she runs off into the darkness of the night. Uh, yeah, which so her brother goes out in the car looking for her, but in the house, the 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 this is it's, this is very much William Castle now. They're in the house, and the uh, mother mother and father and law to be um, uh, hear a jangle. Jingle jangle. What's that noise? Is it Jimmy Savile? Is it Father <laughs> Christmas? Or is it an axe murderer? He says to her, well, look, I'm just going to get my pyjamas on. Is it Jimmy Savile? No, it's not. He, he sends his wife out. He says, you go and look who it is. I'm going to bed. I'd rather Joan Crawford and an axe and Jimmy Savile. He says to his wife, you go and have a look. She says, well, hang on a minute. Can't you check the back door? He says, no, I'm no, going to get my pyjamas on. I've got my milk. I'm calm. He, uh, he does say, I'll get my pyjamas on. I'll be back. Yeah. Um, no, he goes to the front door and looks at us. No one there. You know. Joan, Joan's running around in the bush, isn't she? She's sneaking around like a ninja, and the avoiding fian- all the cars. Well, fiance, dad, we're, uh, we're upstairs with him, and he's we're like waiting for it because we've seen so many horror movies, like like Jamie saying these tropes, like this bit, the whole like going into the cupboard, and they're going into there. At any moment, we're like, where's it going to come? Where's it going to come? And the suspense is really well built up in this. Really, this bit is particularly was it's very really suspenseful. It's he's, really good. he's opening his cupboards, like you said, and it's it's like yes, yeah, it's, it's like a eighties babysitter Halloween type sort of movie. Not Halloween particularly, but those sorts of movies, serial kind of movies. And yeah, here comes the killer out of a closet. Yeah, chops him up nicely. Closet um, dweller coming out of the closet. Dan, Mum goes upstairs to find out what, where Dad is. He said he'd be back in a couple of minutes in his pajamas to help me. There's no one coming down. Look, where is no, he? No. And she finds wow two the, Joan Crawfords. Well, right, straight away, like the the mother comes out because she just discovers her husband axed up, turns around screaming, and we know what's going to happen. It's almost like watching Psycho. The uh, the axe murdering person comes out, and we're like, oh my god, it is Joan Crawford. But it's like, why does her face look like she's? Like, maybe he had a slight burn injuries or something. Like, what's going on with her face? Like, it's a bit weird. Wow. Well, she, this is the head bust, Scooby-Doo fans. She throws the axe, and it just misses the real Joan Crawford's head. Absolutely. As they tumble, and then it must be weird if you walked in there. It's good you hadn't done acid and walked in yeah, there. Yeah, because she's just... Hang on a minute. She's fighting herself. What's happening? Yeah, and it's it's 
Dun, dun, dun. Her daughter, like we said she earlier. She rips the mask off. It's Carol and wearing the, the mask. The mask she made from the bust of the head she made. It yep. wasn't out of Dysus of her heart. It's because she's a cold hearted bitch. Oh, well, she's insane. She saw her mum cut her dad's head off. That is true. She, she did do it to her mum by doing that. So it's kind of like, well, you did kind of cause this. Um, she shows, Joan Crawford shows Michael the mask and says, look. This is what this is what you were about to marry, um, and Carol reveals, I'm the one that killed everybody. I beheaded all the people. Yep. Um, and she did it all uh, for the for the rich, rich, rich money, money, money wedding. Yep. She wanted the money. Yep. Uh, but also she did it because she's completely unhinged. Uh, Joan Crawford cries outside, and Carol absolutely loses it. And we flash back to it's quite a little scene. girl. It does make you think, though, if you hadn't fucking chopped your husband's uh, head off in front of your daughter, it might not have caused this. Yeah, because we cut back to that the little girl just screaming and crying, and it's yeah, it's, I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. It's quite and then we get the epilogue, yeah. absolutely. Which, um, yeah. Is Joan and her brother, and they're um. They discuss what they're going to do with Carol, what her plan is, and uh, they they have a, they discover you know well this is this was her plan this is how she did it and they kind of unravel it all. They have the tape recorder with the song in it, which is what she would have played to to make her think they were singing the song yeah, about her. It is it is your Columbo moment. It's your Scooby Doo moment. It's the reveal. And and do you know what this all stems from? Because a man couldn't stop getting his penis out and putting it in a vagina. The six million dollar dick. That is, this is the reason. It's all because of a, a, a man couldn't help put his penis somewhere where it shouldn't be. I wonder if they did do anything with his dick when he got all rebuilt after that accident. Because they built, built his arm, his leg, his eye and his ear. We'd have to have something for urinate through, but I don't they made him into the sex machine. Hmm, maybe, like a pump action or something. Still, um, I'm still just pissed off that it's all happened because the dude got a hard on when he's drunk. This whole um, thing. It ends with Carol being in an asylum and her mum saying, well, look, I am going to go and visit her. And her brother says, yeah. I don't think that's a good idea. And she this says, is now, I can. She's my daughter, I've got to help her. I can look after her, finally, because I couldn't before because I was, all, I was locked up. Now she's locked up, I can help her. And it's just like, oh my God. Again, who's in the wrong? But, well, the dad is in the wrong because he humped someone when he was drunk. The mums are in the wrong because she fucking chops her I don't up. think you should have your head chopped off because you hump someone. It is a little full on. But just when you think the ending of this film couldn't be any better, the Columbia lady... Not the Columbia work. Studio, Columbia Pictures lady has her head lying on the ground next to her. Did you notice that? No. Yeah, you know the Columbia lady? Mm-hmm. You know, Columbia Pictures. Mm. Her head's oh. been chopped off, and it's lying on the ground next to her. All right. Fuck you know. I'm glad I haven't done that much to piss everybody And that off. is straight jacket. Spelled in a strange way, S-T-R-A-I-T mm. hyphen jacket. Mm. Uh... An incredible really good movie. movie. Second time I've seen it, first time Gav's seen it. Both uh, love it. I really enjoyed that film. If I if I I've never have well I've never really looked for it, but if I see that on D V D or anything, I'm definitely adding it to the collection. I honestly I love both of these movies so much I couldn't actually I know you can't you can't I stop. can't really push one uh, because I feel like this one is really this one is like your proto slasher, like Jamie said. Definitely, this one is like got some blueprints of slashers, and that's what yeah, should appeal to me. But the to other me one, the art, but the other one is more of a higher pedigree, is in the acting performances. They're both just so so good. Jones Crawford's brilliant in them both. Betty Davis is great in the other one. I honestly, I've given them both eight out of ten on IMDb. Quite high scores. Wow. Um, I love them both, and. I own one of them, and yeah, if I see Straight Jacket anywhere, I'll probably buy that as well. Um, I think they're great, and yeah, I'm really, really pleased we got to talk about these. They Absolutely. just look great. They're really great performances, scores, very classy, and quite shocking for the early 60s. The beheadings and the murderings and people losing their mind, uh, really done to a level that you don't see very often, particularly that when these films were made. So... Big, big, big thumbs up from both of us, I think. 
Yeah, totally. I was just looking at some pictures of Joan Crawford. She's really hot in some of these pictures. Easy now. Ooh, there's a break now, isn't it? Oh, pops a, pops, a, <laughs> pops a loo. So there we go, guys. Well, that was our second and last film of our patrons' picks. Thank you again to our patron, Jamie, for that. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, that was really fun movies to check out. Who's, yeah, who's amazing. Next? Who, I don't know. Well, you don't have to say the names, but uh, I look forward to the next patrons, whoever that is. I've already been contacting them. Don't you worry. Are they contacted back? They have. Good. So don't worry. Uh, but yes, we will take another break and come back and wrap things up. Absolutely. All right. See you again soon. And we're back again, ladies and gents. That was episode episode 128, that was, wasn't it? Non-gendered ghosts. Yeah. Gendered ghosts. (laughs) You've got to include them. That's Uh, our next episode. Yeah. Um, Uh, Thanks thanks for listening, everybody. uh, It's fun to talk about these films. What's going on next? So our next episode, because we're a bit slow and realistically Christmas is going to be here before we know it, our next episode is going to be... Our Christmas episode. Our Christmas episode, which is also our anniversary, nine years it of is podcasting. It is nine year anniversary, which always coincides with the Christmas episode. Now, earlier we were like, fuck, because we were looking at the Christmas movies and we are like, we've done 18 Christmas themed movies. Uh, not all horror. We've done Die Hard, Lethal Weapon. Did we do? No, we didn't do Lethal Weapon. Did yeah, Die Lethal Weapon 1, oh, Die Hard 1 and 2. Right, yeah. And so, you know, we have kind of gone into the stuff that we love around this time. But we are starting to struggle a little bit. But then we... I pulled something out of my bottom. You you pulled something out of your eyeballs. And um, we came up with something. And we decided to go to Belgium... Yes. ...for Christmas. We did. So... <clears throat> For our next episode, our Christmas special. Oh, I can't wait. We're going to be doing two Belgian French language ish movies. One of them is 2004's Calvaire, oh, also known as. That's my choice. Also known as The Ordeal. I only saw this once. When uh, I was in Ireland, funnily enough. I've seen this once myself. Uh, for those that don't know, Mark is a travelling entertainer on his way home for Christmas when his van breaks down in the middle of a Jerkwater town. With some strange inhabitants, is this movie? It's this is dark gonna really, comedy, yeah. and it's at times like, what the fuck? I will have to put off YouTube the uh, the song the patrons in the pub, pub sing on the yeah. piano. There's that overhead S- shot as well. I can't remember the overhead shot. Oh, God, but it's just will. it's basically this dude's basically essentially kidnapped and turned into my wife. You'll be my wife now, Dave. It's, it's. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's great, and it's set at Christmas. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a really like what the fuck movie, and uh, I watched it once and fell in love with it. But I've never seen it on DVD anywhere, so I might have to pick it up for my collection. And we are pairing that up with a movie I've picked, which is a Shudder uh, exclusive, mm-hmm. I believe, and it is 2021. So it's a new one. Yeah. Uh, it's called The Advent Calendar, also known as Le Calendrier. It's a Belgian-French language movie again. Uh, La Calendrière and Eva is a paraplegic and on her birthday, her friend Sophie gives her a strange Christmas advent calendar. It's not tr- the traditional treat that you find when you open each drawer, but a quirky gift that gets scarier and bloodier with each opening. So I'm assuming it's Christmassy because it's called the advent calendar. The trailer would say Christmas, so it must everything, everything in it has got Christmas trees. So, yeah. so we are doing some Christmas, but we're yeah we're we're in we're speaking French. It's a shame that we don't we don't drink anymore because we could get some good Belgian lagers. Well, you uh, I mean, drink. I I probably still will do that. <laughs> um, it's Christmas after all, I'll and try, it'll be our ninth anniversary. And I try not to eat for it. Yeah, either, so. don't eat. No, but I can't wait to do the ordeal. Honestly, that is a movie. I was just like, what the fuck? When there's one scene in it that's just. just the bit in the bar when the the, the it's literally like the, leave my the, wife alone you will leave yeah. my wife alone and all the bar that's people the are... overhead shot that I was talking about oh, it's, right. it's, it's done from bird's eye view it's just like <laughs> what the hell like, yeah. it's not your wife it's a dude <laughs> you've kidnapped great yeah. movie watch it guys If, you, if try and watch it before we talk about it it's a good film and the advent calendar Which so I that is about. yeah that is episode 129, Christmas. And then moving on to uh, the new year, 
Well, actually, Gav, um, we were going to be covering a couple of movies, but it will actually be your choice. So you'll have to have a think about that because it'll be your birthday, won't it? Yeah, that's true. Um, and funny so, enough, I've actually, literally yesterday, I was sitting there going, oh my God. So I figured out, because there's a load of things that I want to cover, and sometimes it's not always horror, but I'm just like, oh my God. So I'm going to have to pull out all my choices, take a photo, probably for my collection, send it to you and go, what have we got planned? Because then I can try and figure out what I want to do, because there's so many films I want to cover. So Gaz's birthday is very early in the year. Uh, so um, twelve days that, in. That will probably be our episode after our Christmas special, and then after that, it will be another patron episode. Yes, yeah, so I need before we record again. I need to discover what episodes, uh, what what films I want to do. Okay, and yeah, then it'll be Patreon again. Yes, it yeah. will. Yeah, and, and then we'll go back to our normal schedule. And we so don't know what. That is either yet, do we? So, we funny don't. enough, we don't know what next couple of episodes are after we, Christmas. All we know is Christmas, and after that, anything could happen. Anything can happen. There we go. You know. But this has been a fantastic episode. Uh, I do love these Patreon episodes, and I thank Matthew Godley for um, suggesting, suggesting this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was obviously the first one so far. So, we've had three now. I look forward to the next one. High yeah. Exploitation. It's a fantastic little subgenre. Yeah, I do hope uh, you guys got to watch these films. They're all on um, Prime. Hmm. Uh, you might have to rent them, some of them, but um, they are available and they're worth it. They're only a couple of pounds or a couple of dollars. Very, yeah. very worth it. You get yeah, some okay. good performances. Just, just, so. uh, and, uh, give, a, give Black and White a chance if you don't like it. I adore Black and White films. I've got a, I own quite a lot. Yeah, they're great. Well, one of my favourite movies of all time is Psycho. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Also, Young Frankenstein. Oh, I was thinking of watching that again, actually. Yeah, I normally watch that for Halloween, and I just didn't, because I was watching Hammer Horror, I just didn't get around to it, but well, I felt like I, I watched, should. It's because I watched that Frankenstein monster movie, which had the dude with his arm up, and he's pushing it down, and I was like, oh, this is what Young Frankenstein is based on, this pretty much this movie. Um, made me think I want to watch it. I can't believe we did a Gene Wilder episode many years ago. Yeah, that and Haunted Honeymoon. Yeah. I do remember that episode though. I was uh, that particular day. I think I was going or that week. I was going through some shit, and uh, uh, I don't think that probably holds up the episode for my uh, uh, excitement. Okay, <laughs> for recording, unfortunately. <coughs> well, it might be fun. Don't know. Anyway, life anyway, does get away at times, next. but Christmas is next. And Daniel, do the things. Let's do the things. Okay, well. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening and sticking with us. Uh, we've slowed down a little bit as we come to the end of the year, but there's illnesses, it's, there's children, there's jobs, and it's, COVID yeah, and it's everything else. COVID, it's work, it's life, it's the way it is. But we've always, look, come on, we've been doing it this many years with a couple of hiatuses. If yeah. we've done it this long, you know that you may as well be safe in our hands and we're going to keep going. We're like Jason Voorhees. We, we are. always come back. We're like Michael Myers. You know. We'll always come back. We're always coming back. We are the podcast on Haunted Hill. We are a proud member of Legion Podcasts. Go to legionpodcast.com, search for us and all the other amazing podcasts that are a part of the Legion, or go to Facebook and search for Legion Podcasts, or search for us, the podcast on Haunted Hill. That's where we're most active. You can join our page, you can join our community, our family of crazy weirdos who share trailers, posters, what they're watching, questions, polls, and just basically just just talk nonsense to each other. Um, but we're also there for each other. Like I said in the intro, have a chat, reach out. You're not on your own. Even if you just message people or post something on Facebook, if it, as evil as Facebook and all these other social medias are, that's where we're most active. Wherever you're listening to us right now, that's where you can find us but you can also find us on Spotify, YouTube, Podlife, Apple Podcasts many many other places as well um, there we go we're on Twitter at Haunted Podcasts we're on Instagram which is the podcast on Haunted Hill Insta we haven't mentioned it so much this episode but we also have a production company called Deadbolt Films um, deadboltfilms.com is the website check out Take 3 it's on there now the short film we made Take three is our new short, which yeah, drops. It's Halloween, it drops, so um, yep. go check it out. People have been enjoying it. Uh, tape three, everybody. And if you go to 
Deadbolt Films on YouTube. That's our YouTube channel. Um, Deadbolt Films is just our Instagram handle. And Twitter is at Deadbolt Films. And finally, and uh, importantly, thank you so much to our patrons. Uh, our beautiful, lovely patrons. Thank you so much. Um, who make this show keep ticking along nicely. Um, thank you very much, of course, to Jamie Salmons, Jamie Jenkins, as she goes by on Patreon. Um, you ran this show, you programmed it. I hope we were good little robots for you for this episode. Really enjoyed your high exploitation. But also, thank you to our other patrons, Don Collier, Matthew Godley, Kevin S5, Sarah Kay, Rachel, RJ McCready, and Lex Boo. Thank you. You guys are awesome, and we love you. We um, really appreciate it. Yeah, you don't have to do it, but you do. And if anybody else wants to become a patron, it all goes to help with things like headphones, uh, software, hardware. Sometimes the rental of films are getting hold of... I didn't mean it in a sexual way. Soft sometimes and hardware. Sometimes it's hard to get hold of movies for us to watch. Yeah, it's really yeah, hard. So and we, we dip into our Random Patreon. eBay yeah. box sets. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah. if you do want to join, go and become a patron. Go to Patreon search for the podcast on Haunted Hill if you can't find it message me and I'll tell you where the link is you get can a free donate. t-shirt yeah you get when you first sign up you get a free t-shirt and you get to join the ranks of becoming a patron pick so you'll pick the two movies for an episode and we'll let you know when it's your turn there and... is a lot of content uh, on uh, on the feed for you as soon as you come a patron and uh, I'm gonna probably film a new thing soon I think as I get out the old collection again I'd like to every once in a while film a little video of things that I own so you can check that out yes and I am reposting our old episodes every Friday to Patreon so I'm just about to post our Christmas episode weirdly where it's out nicely um, from a long long time ago where we covered I'll tell you what we covered now for that Christmas episode this will take you back Gav we covered Better Watch Out and Die Hard One. That was a good show. Oh, nice. Um, so, yeah, so you'll get a T-shirt. You'll get to become a patron pick. You'll get all the uh, bonus content as well and anything else that goes with it. Don't have to do it, but if you want to, that's Thank enough. You. Yeah, if Thank not, you. we're still here anyway. It's all good. Yeah, we do and, this for the love. And uh, we don't put adverts on our show. That's something that uh, we don't do. And we could. No. We only really advertise other shows on the network, really, and that's about it. And sometimes lubricant. Sometimes. Sometimes. So there we go, guys. That was episode 128. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for coming along for the ride. Thanks to patron, uh, patron Jamie. That's what I've just renamed her as, patron Jamie. Yep. It's a good and night from um, George Kennedy in the chicken coop with an axe. It's a good night from a hundred empty bottles of rum lying underneath Joan, um, Be- Betty Davis's bed. Yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a good night from a doctor who's going to go and see what's going on. Good night, doctor. And it's a good night from Joan Crawford's budgie. It is indeed. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Lock the doors and windows. Look under the beds. Check the cupboard for any axe murderers or Michael Myers. And if Betty Davis comes to stay. Hide your booze. Hide your booze. Take care. Good night. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon. Hey!